was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Sarah Hewson. A very good morning to you. It is 6 o'clock on Friday, the 19th of April. Yeah, we'll talk today on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Our top stories this morning. Middle East escalation. Breaking news this morning with reports of Israeli missiles targeting Iran. But Tehran says three drones were intercepted. We'll have all the latest details. Sick Note Britain, the Prime Minister is calling for an end to Sick Note culture in a major speech on welfare reform. And Prince William returns to work for the first time after the Princess of Wales announced her cancer diagnosis. And with high pressure building in the west, the weather looks like settling down a little. Still a long way from perfect, but better. All the details coming up shortly. Now time for all the headlines with Miranda. Good morning. U.S. officials say Iran has been hit by an Israeli missile. Iran's state-run news agency has said air defense batteries have been fired in several provinces. Iranian state TV described a loud noise near Isfahan. Flights have been suspended over several cities, but Iran's state broadcaster has downplayed reports of an attack, saying Isfahan is safe and sound. Iran has been on high alert after Israel said it would respond to Iranian missiles and drones fired at Israel last Saturday night. The husband of former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has been charged in connection with the embezzlement of funds from the Scottish National Party. Peter Morrill was taken into custody yesterday and was questioned by police Scotland detectives. He was previously arrested as a suspect in April last year before being released without charge. A full 12-person jury has been sworn in for ex-U.S. President Donald Trump's historic criminal trial in New York City. The court could hear opening arguments as soon as Monday. The trial, the first ever in which a former U.S. president is the defendant, stems from a hush money payment to a porn star. A Polish man has been arrested and charged with planning to cooperate with Russian intelligence services to aid a possible assassination of Volodymyr Zelensky. Polish prosecutors said the man named as Pavel K was allegedly tasked with collecting information about an airport in Poland used by Ukraine's president. Nearly a quarter of UK five to seven year olds now have their own smartphone. Ofcom research suggests their use of social media has also risen compared to last year, with nearly two in five using messaging service WhatsApp, despite its minimum age of 13. The communications regulator warned parental enforcement of rules appeared to be diminishing. Well, those are the headlines. I'll have another update in an hour's time. Thank you very much indeed, Miranda. A very fast-breaking uh, situation. We've heard that an Israeli missile has struck Iran. These are two US officials uh, telling the news sources, Iranian state media citing unconfirmed reports of explosions in the central province of Isfahan. This is a, a very important part of the world, of course, nuclear enrichment facilities there, also a nuclear power station as well. Israel had, of course, promised a response after Iran's unprecedented attack at the weekend with some 300 drones and missiles uh, being fired at uh, Israel. Will this be seen as an escalation or will it be seen as a limited, targeted, specific attack? We're in the very early hours 
of this information uh, still coming through to us. But we do know three drones were destroyed uh, shortly after midnight in the sky over Isfahan. Uh, and uh, the source says Israeli officials had notified US officials uh, before that uh, operation that a response was coming. Uh, Iran yesterday saying, of course, that its finger was on the trigger if Israel were to attack its nuclear facilities. Very this, much so. we understand at the moment, is more likely to have been targeting a military uh, facility, uh, a military manufacturing facility, drone manufacturing facility, but details still coming in. And of course, uh, that comes on the back of Biden saying to Netanyahu, please do not respond. Also, David Cameron uh, lobbying Netanyahu, uh, Netanyahu saying, we will make our own decision. Well, let's continue with that breaking news from the Middle East, where early reports suggest Israel may have carried out an operation in Iran following the drone and missile attack last weekend. Iranian state media is downplaying the seriousness, saying three drones were intercepted by its air defence systems over the province of Isfahan. Well, we're joined in studio by Talk TV's political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald. Good morning uh, to you, Alicia. What do we know so far? The reports are ongoing that are coming out. We talked about the fact that Israel was warned not to respond to this. And of course, it looks like there was some kind of response. But again, it depends which news agency you're listening to. It does. And that's a very difficult situation to be in where you don't really know where to look to get uh, the actual true and correct information. But what's interesting is obviously we know that both David Cameron, Rishi Sunak and Joe Biden all were urging Netanyahu over the weekend uh, to control the retaliation. So they said, you know, you have your right to defend yourself, you have every right to condemn what happened over the last weekend with Iran, but you need to make sure that you don't risk inflating this conflict further. And what it seems uh, happened here is that the response was actually quite controlled. No one is saying um, so far that it seems to be a huge escalation of the conflicts, but there definitely was some level of retaliation from Israel. Uh, and coming after Netanyahu appearing to give uh, David Cameron a bit of a snub mm. uh, and saying that Israel will make its own decisions. Thank you very much, effectively. I think this all plays into this big question that the public have about how much of an impact other countries really have on this conflict. Lots of people find it quite difficult when they hear maybe Rishi Sunak or Biden or any of these big leaders of other countries come forward and kind of say, share their thoughts on what's happening in the Middle East, because lots of people say, realistically, Netanyahu or Hamas are not really going to listen to Rishi Sunak in the UK, to Keir Starmer, even to Joe Biden, who arguably has more sway in these situations. How much of an impact does that really have? And I think what we saw with this attack is that really not very much. I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu really can just do what he wants to do here. I mean, it's interesting. We've talked about this for the last week. Uh, and certainly last week, Rishi Sunak condemned the reckless attack, said the UK would stand up for Israel's security. As you rightly say, of course, Joe Biden is saying, please do not respond. Let's de-escalate that situation. We are the allies of Israel. And yet, as you rightly say, of course, Netanyahu seems to do what he wants. Yes. And at the end of the day, with any conflict, a war is a war, to put it bluntly. And as much as people on the outside can say, you know, we don't want this to spread further. We don't want you to escalate this conflict he is the leader of the country and he does really have that prerogative to to act as he wishes so there's only so much sway that other people have and lots of people I have accused Rishi Sunak and lots of various other leaders for kind of political posturing here and using this as a chance to kind of say what they would do or or signal some kind of um, political allegiance here just uh, one more development on this. An Iranian space agency official has taken to X uh, to give an update on this. Hussein Dalarian has written, there's been no air attack from outside borders to Isfahan or other parts of the country. He said Israel had only made a failed and humiliating attempt to fly quadcopters, uh, drones, uh, and the quadcopters have also been shot down. Iranian state media also reporting the same, saying that the air defence systems were activated. I mean, as in all of these situations, we get this propaganda war, don't we, uh, as mm. well, where both sides are wanting to save face and Iran does not want to look like it's been targeted. No, and, and no one really wants to admit how much military action has been, has been taken because realistically, any escalation is an escalation and any retaliation to an attack is going to make the conflict bigger mm. and wider and, and drip, bring more countries into it. So, of course, everyone on all sides is definitely going to try and have some level of damage control and downplay what's really going on. 
And, and fascinating, of course, Israel in some ways actually had boxed itself into a corner because it had convened the war cabinet, it said it would respond. So any response from, from Israel has to be proportionate and limited. And as you say, of course, the political ramifications of that, not least in Israel, are very important. It's also really difficult because this idea of being proportionate has been said since the beginning of this conflict. But I think lots of politicians and lots of the public are struggling to understand what that really means. I mean, what does a proportionate war actually entail a war is a war there's mm. going to be mass and, and once you get iran involved is proportionate even a, a, a word that is appropriate mm. in this I and mean, the fears around this the escalation of this and how the wider ramifications could affect us all are pretty strong. Definitely. It's just really hard. How do you measure what a proportionate response is? I mean, that's such a grey area. I mean, one person's idea of what could be a proportionate retaliation is probably totally different mm -hmm. to what someone else uh, would deem acceptable. So it's a really, really difficult one politically and something that I'm sure Netanyahu will come under scrutiny for in the coming weeks, definitely here and probably all over the world. Alicia, do stay with us. Uh, let's now have a look at some of this morning's front pages. In the mail, Nicola Sturgeon's husband, Peter Murrell, has been charged over the alleged embezzlement of SNP funds. The Mirror has an exclusive interview with Mark Menzies' former aide, Kate Fieldhouse, who claims she warned the chief whip after the Fard MP made a 3am call to her requesting £5,000. And the Times leads with the Prime Minister's crackdown on sick note culture as GPs lose the right to sign patients off work. Well, let's stick with that story now as the Prime Minister calls for an end to sick note culture and warns against over-medicalising the everyday challenges and worries of life in a major speech on welfare reform later this morning. Rishi Sunak will say the focus must shift to what work people might be able to do amid government concerns some are being unnecessarily written off as sick and parked on welfare. Well, as you can see, Alicia Fitzgerald uh, is still with us. Uh, th this is a really fascinating announcement from the Prime Minister. He obviously thinks that there is, you know, enormous amounts of sort of political clout behind this, saying we need to get people off works, off benefit. I think 2.3 million people are in that situation. He thinks this is politically an important win. He definitely does. And it also is a very easy topic to create massive dividing lines between him and the Labour Party. I mean, this has very much been a Conservative ethos for a while now, and not just targeting benefits, but just this general idea of inaction, inactivity, people working from home too much when they shouldn't be. All of these things are something that the Conservative Party have really adopted in the run-up to the election. And I think the trouble is, is when you bring in any kind of target towards the welfare system or the benefit system, is you are bound to face some kind of backlash because people will always argue that there are people who do really need benefits and there are people who, who need to make the most of our generous benefit system that we do have in the UK. So Rishi Sunak choosing a bit more of a hard line approach to benefits as we as we approach the election the details of this are going to be interesting aren't they because effectively where gps sign the sick notes or the the fit to work notes mm. as they now called at the moment they're going to take that away from gps and they're going to outsource it to so-called specialists do we know what those specialists, the qualifications those specialists have, are they clinically, are they clinical professionals? We don't, and the, the thing here is, as with lots of NHS kind of measures that Rishi Sunak is putting in place, is it all kind of stems to the fact that we just don't have enough GPs at the moment. So adding pressure to, onto them at the moment with sick notes mm -hmm. and asking that, that of them, I think Rishi Sunak is probably trying to kill two birds with one stone, take some of the pressure away from the NHS GPs and give to these specialists, however, we don't really know a whole lot about who these specialists will be. There's potential that it could be pharmacists, maybe. We saw that Rishi Sunak was really trying to give them more power recently, in recent months, to prescribe medication. So this could definitely fall into their remit. And, and just in terms of that, I mean, we're going to lose even more GPs. 8,800 are going to step down from their roles. And the GPs themselves are sick and tired of acting as social workers because, mm. of course, you can sign yourself off sick for seven days. Anything after that, you have to go to the GP. GPs are so pushed in terms of time anyway mm. People know they can't get an appointment, so I think they would welcome an external outside body actually having some sort of say in this. I'm sure they definitely would. The issue that I, I think Rishi Sunak and the government will face with this is that lots of people will just ask, are these specialists qualified to actually be deeming people un, unfit to work? Also, the other thing is, and this is something that Rishi Sunak has made very clear that he is against, is he wants to just lower the amount of people on benefits full stop. So will this transition to making specialists write sick notes actually reduce the amount of people 
not going to work because they're sick, that's really up for debate at the moment. We'll have to wait and see whether that's effective. Ultimately, it's a sticking plaster, isn't it? It's not looking at the causes of the problem or getting to the roots of it whatsoever. Definitely not. And, and Rishi Sunak has got a difficult task in trying to reduce the amount of people on benefits because clearly there are lots of people who do need them. But something that the Conservative Party are really, really keen on tackling is the amount of people who are claiming them when potentially mm. they probably don't need to. It is quite a small figure, but it's something that Rishi Sunak sees as quite an easy political, political game. And he needs to have some political gains, doesn't he? Of course, the local elections are coming up. Uh, two weeks to go until the local elections, of course. Uh, the latest polling for the... Tories does not look good at all, uh, does it? No, so there was a new poll today that shows Rishi Sunak at his pretty much lowest ever and only one point up from when Jeremy Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party. So Jeremy Corbyn was rated really, really badly, at, well, through various points in his, in his premiership, but I think he was minus 60 um, yes. at one point. And Rishi Sunak's now on minus 59. So he's almost there. Almost there, <laughs> yeah. And the Tories, at their lowest polling score since records began for it, Osmari, in 1978. And the crazy thing about that that's is... a I long time ago, is, I can tell it's you. It's a very long time ago, <laughs> yes. I don't think that's going to come as a shock to anyone watching right now. I don't no. think anyone's going to go, oh, that's really shocking news. We've had poll after poll after poll that have just shown the Conservative Party in more and more dire states. So, so just in terms of this poll, this is Ipsos for the Evening Standard. They also look at volatility of, of those that they polled. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think what's interesting here is half of those who responded say, they had a voting intention and they had made up their mind who to vote for, but 47% would change their mind. So what does that mean? Does it mean that they're actually telling the truth to the pollsters or does it mean that actually politics really is in the state of flux? I, I think the latter for sure. And this has been a growing problem for a while for politicians on all sides. It's not the people who know that they are going to vote for one party. It's not the people who think, oh, I've, I'm a lifelong so-and-so voter. It's the amount of growing number of people who just still don't know where they're going to put their vote. We have an election this year, and there are so many members of the public who still say that absolutely no one seems appropriate for them at the moment. So the problem with that is they may not vote at all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, campaigners, canvassers on the doorstep coming up again and again with, let's look at yesterday, for example, a pretty bad day in politics with the allegations about Mark Menzies. Mm. We had uh, Peter Murrell being uh, charged, for example. Mm. We've got the, the allegations against Angela Rayner uh, rumbling on. It all looks pretty sleazy, yes. doesn't it? And that's a real turn-off for voters. It absolutely is, and it's interesting because we were having this chat yesterday um, about specifically the Mark Menzies thing, mm. and lots of people were saying, you know, why, how have they not learned their lesson? Surely they all know that these things are going to come out. But it makes you realise just how precarious the reputation of some of these individual MPs, but also the parties in general, are to the public at the moment, that they would always way rather try and put something under the carpet rather than risk exposing another issue that they have within the party because things are so precarious. I mean, I know you spoke about it yesterday, but Mark Menzies, this is an extraordinary story. This morning, Kate Fieldhouse said that she knew about this. She was the lady that he actually rang about the funds being needed to pay off bad people. It was £5,000 at that time. It then turned out to be £6,500. He's resigned the whip. Now they have a working majority of 51. They started at 80. Yes, I mean, that's a huge uh, detonation of MPs over a really short space of time. I think this is a really interesting story because I think it does slightly feed into what happened with the Westminster Honey Trapper just last week. It's another situation where an MP has found themselves in some kind of compromising situation and then effectively what it seems has been blackmailed or has been threatened in some way and had to get themselves out of this situation. And that's a strange place to be where we have these people who are public representatives who are finding themselves in these compromising situations so frequently. And, and more damagingly for the, the wider party is what Katie Fieldhouse is saying this morning is that she went through all the correct processes. She reported it to the local party association. It then went to CCHQ, to the Tory uh, central office. And then what? Three months went by and it was only when the Times published this story that 
oh, suddenly there's an investigation going on. Definitely, and even Grant Shapps, who's obviously very senior within the Conservative Party, came forward and said he was aware that, that this was happening three months ago. So it's so easy now. You've basically, they've opened their doors to attack from the Labour Party, from all opposition parties, for people to just say, you should have acted more swiftly. I mean, this is clearly... there's Whoever is telling the truth uh, in this story, there's still clearly something strange that's happened. And because we should say Mark Menzies denies yes, the claims he that he misused. Totally denies, funds. totally denies that. Um, but clearly there's something's happened here and the Conservative Party have the responsibility to get to the bottom of it. Uh, let's talk about Peter Murrell, though. Uh, of course, the SNP, this is bad news for the SNP. He's been re-arrested and charged. We have to be careful about what we say. Mm -hmm. But again, it seems another political party and more spotlights being shone on them. Definitely. I mean, the SNP are in pretty bad shape at the moment and have been for quite some time. I mean, they're not doing so well in Scotland. Labour are far more popular and it, they are predicted to get way more seats than the SNP and pretty much sweep up all those seats uh, in Scotland that the SNP currently have. Uh, so the SNP is generally not in a brilliant situation, but this is just another damning, you know, revelation to, to them. And especially at the moment, Hamza Youssef, the, the new First Minister, he's not super popular and uh, lots of people aren't massively um, pro him. So this is another issue that he's going to have to deal with. I mean, the only party for whom this might have worked slightly in their favour was Labour because it did take the focus off Angela Rayner. I mean, all of these stories have. I mean, it's really mm. easy. Keir Starmer yesterday coming forward and saying, you know, the Conservative Party have questions to answer about what happened with Mark Menzies. And calling for a police investigation. Yes, and I've even heard lots of Conservative MPs say that, you know, he was on a bit of a moral high ground with that because it, so it seems that he's totally just managed to get rid of that Rayner story and now focus on this, which, I mean, arguably is going to be in the news for some time. Mm. So. And let's just talk about the safety of Rwanda, Bill, because, of course, this is we pressing time. Well, I, well, the <laughs> reason is... Well, and again, and again. And again. And again. Well, I think that's the point, isn't it? Yes. It's carrying on. We've had four amendments sent back. There was a lot of criticism about Rishi Sunak saying, why didn't it sit overnight? Let's get it done, let's get it dusted and get it over the line. Well, uh, this is a bit of a conspiracy theory, maybe, but my theory about this is that he kind of doesn't want to rush it through. He needs the time, all the time he can get to try and get just one flight off. He needs to kind of prolong this period. Well, he's pushing so... the definitions of spring, <laughs> isn't he? <laughs> also, the, fav the best thing about that is it was emergency legislation and there's nothing emergency about it whatsoever, clearly. I mean, this has been so protracted for so long mm. now. But I think that realistically, he kind of needs it to drag out a little bit longer if he wants it to succeed in any way. I think his only goal is to get at least just one flight off before the election. And if he can prolong that and make sure it goes smoothly, then he's going to do it. And, of course, he met with Kagame. They say they can ramp up the capacity in Rwanda as well. He is desperate for a win as we approach the election. What are you hearing from Westminster in terms of that timing? I know I ask you every single time. <laughs> Have you heard anything? I mean, it's, it's interesting, because on the one hand, we're hearing stories... Well, it's not even stories. It's, it's totally factually true that lots of the houses that were built for the asylum seekers have actually been sold to, to Rwandans mm. because there's no one living in there. I think 175 have been sold, yeah, quite, yes. quite, That's quite a lot, yeah. And probably a lot more migrants than he'd be sending on one flight to Rwanda in, in one go. So the, on the one hand, we have all of these obstacles, but then we still have lots of Conservative MPs coming forward and saying that they have total faith in the policy and that they really do believe that flights are going to take off before the election. So on a personal level, I think it's quite unlikely. And if a flight does take off, it will be you know, a handful top. So nothing that's going to massively impact the situation. OK, Alicia, thanks very much indeed. Alicia is going to be back with us in the next hour. Still to come here on Talk Today. Good news for students under 30 as the EU visa rules are relaxed and the British fryer is in danger of dying out. What? Broadcaster Nikki Hodgson and former political advisor Leon Emirali take us through this morning's papers. That's next. Stay with us. It is 6.22. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, 
not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> <laughs> Yeah. For... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. The home of big opinions. Oh, don't start me on that. Straight talking. There's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. And no nonsense. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Is going digital. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Make sure you're ready. But the government has got to be more flexible. From the end of April, listen to talk on radio via DAB or your smart speaker. Or watch live on YouTube on your connected TV. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 6.26. We'll have the weather for you in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. It's official. The full English breakfast <laughs> is apparently not a healthy start to the day. Do we need to be told that? Do you agree? Uh, most young people do. That is in the papers next. A royal return. Prince William returns to work after his wife's cancer diagnosis. We'll discuss this with royal commentator Afia Hagen just before seven. And should nicotine patches be offered to children who vape? That's what health officials are calling for. We'll be discussing it just after eight o'clock. But first of all, that all important weather. Joe, I don't know whether I'm coming or going. One minute it's hot, then it's cold. What's it going to do today? It's, it's going to settle down a little bit. That's the good news. We've got high pressure in sight. And that, uh, at this time of year, is always good news. But it doesn't mean to say we're going to see perfect conditions for everybody. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, we seem to have seen so many low-pressure systems go through the country, bringing wet and windy weather, that high pressure is indeed good news. And here it is, setting itself up out towards the west. It drifts a little, and as it does, we'll see various parts of the country affected by a little bit of rain, somewhat breezy in places. But in essence, we're looking at drier, brighter conditions. And once it's there, it's going to stay over the weekend into next week. You can also see we'll see a little bit of rain here and there as well. So starting off this morning, there is quite a lot of cloud around, some outbreaks of showery rain. These are sinking their way southwards, so a bit of a dull day uh, through many central, eastern, southern areas, but much brighter skies over Scotland. Yes, this is where we're going to see the best of the sunshine early on in the day. 
Temperatures making their way up into double figures, 10 to 12 degrees Celsius. Still some fairly heavy showers through central and eastern areas. A lot of sunshine as well for parts of Wales. Few showers out towards the west. And overall temperatures, as I say, double figures could peak at around 14, 15 degrees Celsius in the west. But those eastern areas will be a good deal cooler just 9 or 10 degrees Celsius there. And to go with that, we've got quite a strong northerly wind that's driving that uh, cloud onto those eastern coasts. And we'll see a few showers to go with that as well. And then as we go towards this evening and overnight, largely clear skies. And that does mean it's going to be a cold night. Temperatures low enough in some places to give a touch of a grass frost, maybe even a one or two pockets of an air frost as well. So a chilly start to Saturday. Again, there'll be a fair amount of sunshine around. Those northerly winds continuing to push some cloud across those eastern coasts into central areas, making their way westwards. And we'll also see cloudy conditions for Scotland as well. Here we could see some outbreaks of rain. So a bit of a dull, wet day for Scotland. Temperatures, though, very similar into double figures. Elsewhere, a mixture of cloud and sunny spells, but also to go with that, we've got some fairly decent temperatures, still feeling chilly on those eastern coasts, but generally for the entire country, we're going to see lighter winds. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thanks very much, Joe. Time to go through the papers with broadcaster Nikki Hodgson and former political advisor Leon Emirali. Uh, first, though, let's discuss a story which didn't make the papers this morning, and that is the reported missile strike from Israel into Iran. Um, Nikki, what do we know? Well, we don't know very much, really. I mean, what we know is that potentially Iran are six months away from developing nuclear weapons. Mm. Um, they have been enriching uranium for a few years now. They have this Natanz facility, which uh, Israel know where that is. Uh, it's deep underground. It'd be very diff difficult to target if they wanted to try and take it out, which is one suggestion that actually if things escalate, they're going to have to try and destroy uh, Iran's nuclear capability. But the problem, of course, is that the gene is out of the bottle. They've figured out how to do it. Mm. So if you destroy whatever has already been uh, created, it'll just be remade somewhere else at another time. Yeah, it's extremely worrying for the region. I, I think it is. Uh, Leon, uh, Iran has uh, responded by actually saying the Isfahan nuclear facility is intact. This is obviously very impressing. What do you make of, of what we know now? Because Israel obviously wasn't backing down, convening the war cabinet, almost telling David Cameron what to do, because Netanyahu said he will be in charge of any response from Israel. Also ignoring President Biden as well, saying, please de-escalate this situation. Mm -hmm. And if these reports are right, Israel chose a different path. They did, David. I mean, this is a escalation, no doubt, on behalf of, of the Israeli government. The West, the America, UK, were all saying, do not retaliate because, as Nikki says, Iran is not the type of enemy you want to be messing with. They took their time, and it did look like for a period that Israel were going to hold off of these strikes. But I think that the, the, the domestic pressure to retaliate after Israel was attacked was too much, and they've now gone ahead and done this. And I think what we could face is a situation where we just see a constant volley of missiles between Iran and between Israel back and forth and you've now got this hot war in the region that is the, the worst thing. You, you said you domestic want. pressure. What about political pressure on Netanyahu himself? Because of course he's not widely popular in Israel. Indeed. So Netanyahu, the only thing that is popular in Israel at the moment is this conflict, is the conflict against Hamas uh, in, in Gaza. And I think for Netanyahu being able to deliver promises on how he's going to tackle uh, uh, the terrorists militarily is what's but keeping him in post. But he's not delivering on the hostages, and that is also mm. causing a lot of upset within Israel, isn't it? I mean, in terms of the, the way this response has played out so far and what we know about it so far, Nikki, it wasn't the devastating response that the Israeli War Cabinet had been talking about earlier this week and had warned about. It looks at this point that it was a single strike sure. on a very specific, deliberately chosen target. Does that de-escalate somewhat? It doesn't if Iran thinks it doesn't. I mean, it's, well, Iran's it's, playing it down as well, aren't sure. they? Mm. There's a perception gap, but there's also, you know, where, you know, where the media we work with a certain limited amount of information yes. about what actually has happened, as opposed to what's happened behind closed doors or what they're keeping from us, because actually everybody starts to panic. Mm. Um, maybe they've got better control of the situation than they make out, but I don't see why they wouldn't be saying that. I mean, I think the difficulty now for the West is how do we 
continue to support Israel if we do in their fight against Hamas if they are going to willfully ignore this de-escalation advice which puts everybody at risk. There were also going to be questions mm. after the United States because they were given warning mm. uh, about this yeah. uh, by Iran. How much warning mm. and how much are they being drawn in? By Israel, rather. Mm. And we'll also talk about the role of Qatar as well, of course, mm. uh, in terms of mediation. Let's move to the, this morning's papers, though. What did make print this morning? The Daily Telegraph. Prime Minister vows to end the sick note culture. Leon... Clearly, this is something the Prime Minister thinks he's on the front foot for. We've seen the polling is absolutely dreadful. He thinks this is a winner. He does. And you know what? I think he might be right, because we've got a culture in this country now where the smallest inconvenience means that you don't have to go to work. And the, the figures around this are astonishing, because in 2015, 5.3 million people were out of work. This year... Sorry, last year, 11 million. Mm. So it's more, more than, double. than doubled, which is astonishing. So clearly there is a problem in this country. And for the Prime Minister to come out and, and, and first of all, identify that is good news. What I'd like to hear in this speech is the practicalities of how he's going to do it. Because is it just sound bites? Is it just good headlines? And they are good headlines. Or is there actually some substance behind it? That's exactly what we've mm, been discussing exactly. uh, this morning. Who are these fit-to-work notes going to be outsourced to? Whose responsibility is it? What qualifications do they have? What happens if you end up with a GP disagreeing with what the so-called specialists have said? Right. I mean, I, I'm very worried about this because, actually, we do have a mental health and a physical health epidemic mm. right now because of NHS waiting lists because of the pandemic and because of the, the sheer turmoil and the chaos of lockdown, of what people are dealing with. And we don't know how to tackle mental health because we don't fund it properly. We don't have anywhere near the amount mm. of therapists or consultants in the NHS. Our, our, our procedure at the minute is just to give people antidepressants, which doesn't help long term. That You've got to understand that the pandemic has fundamentally shift, shifted a lot of people's relationship with work. I, they don't see work as the be all and end all anymore. And you might think that's negative for the economy, but maybe it's not, depending on how we can repurpose But it's not really surprising, people. I was going to say, if the government said, stay home, don't go out, right. don't work, you know, what that's what, that was the message from central yeah. government. And now we're reaping the rewards of that. There's we? also a double whammy in that the pandemic has had a very negative impact on people's mental health Absolutely. Yes, as well. Absolutely. And so, so it's not then... as simple as saying loads of people decided to share, we don't want to do it anymore. Actually, there's a lot of people that are really struggling, really struggling. I mean, mm. do you know how difficult it is to get an appointment to see a psychiatrist on the NHS if you say you are suicidal? It takes months by which point it's too late for a lot of people. And this is the multifactorial problem, because, of course, the GP is used as the gatekeeper. And I think what Rishi Sunak is trying to do here is to say, let's take some of the casework yeah. away from the GP to actually liberate them to see the patients sure. so they can then refer. But it doesn't get away but from it, the fact there aren't enough psychiatrists in the first place. No, absolutely. And Nikki's right, by the way. There is a mental health problem in this country, as well as being a, a, a sick note problem. And I think there's a balance, isn't there? And the difference is a bad day is not a mental health problem, it's a bad day. Or I think you have to be able to differentiate between what is a genuine concern, someone who does need time off to recuperate, and someone who perhaps could go a little bit further, maybe inconvenience mm. himself slightly, and put in the work. Yeah, the, the insinuation in all of this is that the system is being abused, isn't it? Yeah. And that it is just too easy to And Mel to Stride, get of course, off. saying yes. that the ups and downs of normal everyday life has mm. become medicalised. And mm. I think there is a point to that. But it will be interesting to see how this plays out. I think a lot of people around the country will think, well, good, someone's going to do something about it. Yeah, and the other problem we've got is we've got a very ageing population in the UK. So our workforce is, is shrinking. And if we yeah. do want to tackle immigration as well, which I think a lot of the country want to see happen, then we need to make sure we've got people working to fill mm. the jobs that are required to actually have a functioning economy. So mm. it's really important both economically as well as from a health point of view. Uh, Nikki, let's turn to the mirror. And the mirror has an exclusive interview with uh, Katie Fieldhouse, the 78-year-old who uh, was the aide to Mark Menzies MP. Yes, yeah, so Mark Menzies is the MP who has been... He's in trouble for basically what it looks like is taking money from random donors, uh, not donors even, people that he's targeted for cash and funneling it into his personal account for medical expenses. He's the MP for Lanc uh, the Lancashire Seat Field. Uh, this, so this is an account from Katie Fieldhouse who said that he rang her on December the 1st, mm. allegedly, uh, asking for £5,000, saying he was locked in a flat and needed to secure his release and that it was a life-or-death situation. Yep. 
bad people. Ke bad, people bad people after him. And Katie Fieldhouse quite prudently decided to put the phone down and instead ring his office manager, who dealt with it the next day. So obviously it wasn't a life or death situation. Mm. He was still still around. By which sort of time 12 it went from 5,000 to 6,500. The, the amount believe. being asked for had gone up. Yeah, I mean, I, if anybody rings you at three in the morning, by the way, asking <laughs> for a large sum of money, it doesn't matter in what profession, <laughs> you generally presume a few things. Maybe they're not in their right mind, as in sober, and maybe... Uh, they're just having, they're just kind of having some kind of odd delusion, or they're up to something that's actually quite pernicious. I mean, in any other situation, in any other workforce, if somebody that you worked with rang you up at three in the morning, you'd just be like, get rid of this, but like, what's yeah. going on? Mm. And actually, if they're really concerned about, if the Tory party are concerned about my menses, then why aren't they investigating and supporting yeah. his mental health and figuring out what on earth is, what on earth is this about? And, and Leon, just in terms of this, we heard it came from the office manager in the end, who was then reimbursed by campaign donations. Mm. And it seems the Times has reported that there were £14,000 worth in total mm. that had been paid. Now, if you donate to a political party, you expect it to go to a political party, and not, if this is true, into the pocket of an individual MP. Quite right. I think if you, if you give that money, you want it to go on leaflets and posters and campaign literature, you yeah. You don't want it to go into the back pocket of someone who's, you know, got a potentially got a problem with, with with substances and other issues. So I just think the issue we've got in the Conservative Party is that it seems as though every MP has got some sort of issue, and it's just it's it's stark, it's bizarre for a lot of people. You've got think, a good fact about this, haven't you? The number of independent <laughs> MPs sitting. Eighteen. Yeah. Eighteen MPs sitting as independents, and the majority of those. And look, it's not only Tories, but the majority the of them are Tories. The and you're right yeah. that the impression it gives, mm. and that's crucial in an election year, mm. the impression that that gives to the public is that they're all sleazy. They're, 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 they're and... all on the make, they're all, they're all sleazy. It, 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 it's reminiscent, isn't it, of what happened in the 90s at the end of the Conservative yeah. government, yeah. where I think these, yes. these MPs have been in for too long, yep. they think they're all powerful, they can get away with anything, and I tell you what, the public are starting to see through it. it it's it's yep. not on. And, Nikki, but that's, th that's reflected saying. in the yeah. polls, isn't it? Yes, and it's what the constituents are saying, actually, about, in this particular example, the constituents are saying he's been in that seat for years, mm. it was too easy, it was too cushy, you've taken your eyes off him, and... People have had enough. Yeah. I mean, I talk to so many people who say, I'm not going to vote, I don't like politics, and I ask, and obviously I'm desperately political and want to know why, and they tell me the same reason. They all have examples like this, and these examples stay with people. Mm -hmm. Leon, sorry, carry on. I was going to say, what are people going to remember? Are they going to remember the number 10 announcement on Sick No Britain? <laughs> or are they going yeah. to remember... Or another MP yeah. losing the whip. Exactly. exactly. So it's a political problem. Should, should we move on? This is a really interesting yeah. story in The Eye. It's the front page of The Eye. And I raised my eyebrows this morning when I read it. This is under 30 set to benefit from the EU plans to tax, uh, relax the visa rules. And that would allow these young people to live, work and study in European countries for up to four years. And there are lots of reasons why I raised my eyebrows this morning. What did you think? I read it, David, probably with a different lens. And, and I think actually it's quite positive because we have to remember that young people overwhelmingly voted to remain uh, in, in the European Union when we had that vote. Uh, and I think being able to deliver for them the opportunity to have that freedom to, to travel in Europe is not a bad thing. And I'll go back to the earlier point I made also about the workforce in this country ageing. If we're able to have under 30s, fit people who can work, who can do jobs in this country, skilled people, uh, then I think it's good for the UK as well. What it does do, and maybe why you're raising your eyebrows, David, is that it opens the door, doesn't it, for a closer relationship with the European Union. And I think that Ursula von der Leyen said that, that the Windsor framework that Rishi Sunak negotiated has meant the UK and the and European Union are on a much better footing and they can collaborate. I think it's a good thing. We do need to have a good relationship with Europe, even if we're not in, in the, the club. Absolutely. And it's a reciprocal yeah. arrangement. And it's it reciprocal. Is. I mean, I've been desperately trying to find out how to get an Irish passport for my daughter because we have a great grandmother who's mm. Irish, just so that she will be able to work in Europe. I, it's one of the saddest things to me about Brexit that she won't have that liberty, but potentially she will now. But, so. but maybe, as you say, closer ties means actually uh, we're on friendlier footing. But also, the UK government's response has been, we decide to do deals with various countries mm. and we're not dealing with the EU as a bloc. What do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, that's again, that, that's within the rights of the UK government to do that. And that is one of the freedoms that we get from Brexit, is we can negotiate with individual countries. And it may well be that we want to have a deal with France and Italy and not necessarily Romania and Poland or whatever, whatever way around mm. it might be. But uh, the, the, the European Union 
is an important economic block, and we don't have to re to re re rehearse the uh, the arguments of Brexit. <laughs> Please but, don't. But, but <laughs> Please don't. We've done that enough. But it is an important important block, and we should have a relationship with them. Important to see how Keir Starmer responds to this, because it's likely to be his issue, isn't it? Mm. It's a one way of appealing to the youth vote potentially, but it also opens him up to those easy accusations that and, and so he's he, too he, close he is treading a very difficult line yeah. here, mm -hmm. isn't he? Because on one hand, if he says, actually, we're looking for closer European ties, he'll alienate one core uh, of the voter. And then, of course, if he actually says, we really appreciate this, we think it's a great idea, he gets the youth vote. Sure, but he... Kn I mean, we know, we know that Starmer is very pro-Europe. He still wants a close relationship with Europe. And I think if he gets in, that will only become more evident over the the coming months. So I think in time he will actually go for this. Probably, I reckon before the election he will agree with this anyway. We haven't got much time left. Just a quick look at the front of the Daily Star. <laughs> RIP, the full English. One in ten what? youngsters has never had <laughs> what the Star describes as the world's best breakfast. Goodness. Full English. Well, yes, one, no. yeah, one in ten 18 to 24 year olds has never had a fry up. I'm actually aghast at that statistic. That is, that is quite something, but we were, we were speaking about it. Smashed avocado for them. Perhaps, but they don't drink. Whole, they don't eat the fry. Toast, yes. yeah. But I, I love a fry. But my goodness, once you've had one, you've got to you've got to take the day off of it. You've got to get back to bed. No Britain. I mean, it, there's just too much food. No, it's delicious. How about black pudding? Oh no. no. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. No. yes. I'm with you. Hash browns. <laughs> yes. Hash browns. Hundred percent. Black puddings. No. It's like a scab. That's all a black pudding is, isn't it? <laughs> What? No, That's what you're going to imagine. Is it fried eggs it. or is it scrambled eggs? Fried. Scrambled and fried. Oh, yes, All why not? Right. Push why them not? better. <laughs> <laughs> making me really hungry. Um, <laughs> thank you to both of you. Uh, Nikki and Liam, back in just under an hour for another look through. Now, videos. you've been getting in touch with all your views and opinions. Also, we're asking this morning, uh, based on the front page of The Telegraph this morning, Rishi Sunak vowing to crack down on sick note Britain. Uh, this is a really important uh, question, I think, and particularly for me as a, uh, a as a physician. Should GPs lose the right to sign patients off work? Let us know your thoughts on that, please. Email us talktoday at talk.tv. You can tweet us at talktv. You can also text us, text the word talk, and your message to 8722. Uh, we're also, another health story we're talking about, uh, health officials saying vape-addicted children uh, should be offered nicotine patches to help wean them off. Will this tackle the rise of youth mm. vaping? What do you think about that? And also, when do you want this general election? Recent findings reveal over half of Brits want a general election uh, by the end of the summer. So the big question, should we go early or should we go late? Can he hold on till Or the can election? he hold on? Yes, uh, and we'll talk see today at talk.tv is the email for us. Tweet us at Talk TV, or you can text us, text the word talk, plus your message to 8722. And still to come, Prince William returned to public duties yesterday and broke his silence for the first time since Kate's cancer diagnosis. More on that and other royal news, that's next. This is Talk Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Now, Prince William has been spotted on his first royal engagement since the Princess of Wales' shock cancer diagnosis was revealed. The Prince visited a surplus food redistribution charity in Surrey where he reassured royal fans that he's taking good care of Kate after he accepted Get Well Soon cards for both his wife and his father, the King. Well, joining us on this now is royal commentator Afia mm -hmm. Hagen. Afia, really good to see him out and about actually yeah how much should we interpret into this you know he's known for his dedication to charities generally mm -hmm. but the fact he is away from his wife mm -hmm. I, I take it as good news i think we can look at it like that but remember that we didn't know that the princess of wales had cancer and he was out doing public engagements then so i think we can take it that she's well enough to be left alone that the children are okay that they're going to school all right he doesn't need to be there for them you know during the school day i think this is brilliant for charities charities like this particular one really benefit from having a principal from the royal family come and visit them. There'll be lots of charities up and down the country who will be thinking, OK, great, we're going to have one of our principals out and about doing the service and bringing the publicity to them that they need. Mm. And he very much wanted to maintain the focus on the charity yesterday, mm. didn't he? There was a brief mention of Kate <laughs> yep. uh, when he was given a, a car, and we can talk about that. Um, but, you know, there was a huge amount of scrutiny on what would not have been a pretty everyday engagement for him under normal yeah. circumstances. Absolutely. Um, lots of people gathering outside. Obviously, this is peak interest. Front of many of the pages. Mm. Exactly. The pages today. Um, because we didn't see him at all over Easter holidays. At that time was dedicated after the Princess of Wales told us about her cancer diagnosis, dedicated to family, no public engagements whatsoever. This is kind of first day back on the job. So everybody very interested. And it kind of does put the spotlight, in a way, back on the Princess of Wales as well. Mm. People will now be thinking, OK, we've seen him. When are we going to see her? But we have to remember, we're not going to get a running commentary. We're not going to get regular and updates. So. Absolutely. And I think the next thing we'll hear will just be when she decides to come back, her first public engagement, you know, after recovery. And we just don't know when that will be. Um, really interesting, actually, front page of the Daily Telegraph. And, of course, uh, the caption there is, he promises support for his wife rather than you know actually focusing on the charity work mm -hmm. let's talk about his brother because his brother is, has put something in writing which mm -hmm. i think has also made a lot of people sit up and, and take notice what's he done well yes yeah. so this is some documents that came out yesterday that basically says that last year on june the 29th when himself and his wife the duchess of sussex we're talking about prince harry of course uh when the duke and duchess of sussex moved their belongings from frogmore cottage june the 29th he put that as the day that he became a u.s citizen basically began living in america didn't become a u.s citizen excuse me he's a he, resident yes yeah. became a resident began living in america uh and put that basically 
Bradley as his, his new place of residence. This was business documents that were filed at company's house. And t 29th of June, we know, is the day that uh, the King said that basically he wanted Frogmore Cottage back. There was talk of other members of the royal family moving in there. Uh, and So just to be clear, he yeah. basically chose that day yeah. because it was the date when he got kicked out of that, that residence rather yes. than the date when he became a resident in the United States. Yes. He's chosen that date. I wonder why. I'm not on top because, you know, he'd been in the US for kind of two, three years by then. And I think maybe he thought he would always have a UK base. And if he doesn't have a UK base, then that was kind of the end of his time of living in the US, becoming a US resident, not a citizen. Yeah, yeah. and, and he, couldn't, he couldn't put an address down as being resident in the UK on that official mm. form because he doesn't have one. Yeah. Fact. Is that what you're reading into it? Well, there isn't a no, 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 UK true. address anymore. There's mm. nowhere to say that he is a UK resident because so, he doesn't have a home. So he has to say, if that's the day that he moved his belongings from his UK home, he doesn't have one. It's the last that possible moment. And is there any the news on him uh, because he has said he wants to become a US citizen? Any news on that? OK, he didn't actually say he wants to become a okay. US citizen. When he was asked about it in an interview, he said it's something that he considered, but it's very far away from his mind at the moment. Uh, so there is no news on that at the moment. Of course, we're waiting for the revelation of his US visa documents. This is um, a freedom of information request in the US that's been made by this right wing, right wing think tank called the Heritage Foundation. And it's about, you know, how he got his visa, whether he put um, down on his visa application that he'd taken drugs or not, yes. uh, or if there was special treatment. We're waiting for that to be revealed, if it does. But President and the Biden has said... US ambassador to the UK saying, yes. not going to reveal any documents during a Biden administration. Exactly. And that Prince Harry is safe during a Biden administration, but the, the election looms near in November. Indeed. Should we talk uh, about Meghan's jam? Yes. Uh, Have you got your we, jam yet, Sarah? I, I haven't received my jam Because I'm still yet. waiting for mine. I haven't well, received mine. It's unfortunate. Um, her Montecito uh, American Riviera Orchard website. Yes. Set up in the United States. Yep. Still a holding page there. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a UK version, apparently. Apparently. Not, not as all as... All is not as it seems. No. So this popped up yesterday that someone's put in American River, Riviera Orchard.co.uk and it doesn't take you to anything American Riviera Orchard related. Uh, it takes you to a holding page um, that says something like uh, forgiveness, forgiveness. Yep. Uh, permission, permission uh, sending best wishes to Catherine, and then a link that takes you to the Trussell Trust. And the Trussell Trust are a charity that are working to end the need for food banks, basically. In this uh, country? Yeah, in this country. Yeah. Brilliant charity. Um, mm. And there's um, a link... Very much in line raid. with what Prince William was doing yesterday. Indeed. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and there's a link to take you to donate to them and they're trying to raise a £1,000. So someone... I mean, the, the kind of... The line is that it's been hacked and hijacked. But actually... I think if Meghan Markle saw this, she'd be like, yeah, brilliant. Donate to the Trussell Trust. Well, they're it, a great it's not charity. hacking, is it? It's cyber squatting, if that. If yeah. someone also taking up that domain name. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Um, I don't think she'll be bothered at all in any way, shape or form, because she's got the dot Great bit of marketing, I have to say, for Absolutely. a very good cause. Absolutely. Yeah, so do I. Uh, Afia, thank you very much. Thank you. Indeed. Still to come, we'll return to the rising tensions in the Middle East following reports. Israel carried out an operation with drones in Iran overnight. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid 
for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 Yeah. Minute, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Sarah Hewson. A very good morning to you. It is 7 o'clock on Friday the 19th of April. Yeah, we talk today on TV, radio, online and, of course, on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. Middle East escalation, breaking news this morning with reports of Israeli missiles targeting Iran. But Tehran says three drones were intercepted. We'll have all the latest details. Sick note Britain. The Prime Minister is calling for an end to sick note culture in a major speech on welfare reform. And Liverpool crash out of the Europa League as Klopp's reign as manager reaches its conclusion. And many parts of the country will see drier, brighter conditions this weekend, but it will still feel pretty chilly, especially along the North Sea coast where the winds remain strong. And for gardeners, there's still the risk of overnight frost as well. All the details coming up shortly. But now it's time for your headlines with Miranda. Good morning. U.S. officials say Iran has been hit by an Israeli missile. Flights have been suspended over several cities. Iran's state-run news agency has said air defense batteries have been fired in several provinces. Meanwhile, Iran's Tasnim news agency has posted these pictures of Isfahan's nuclear facility, saying Isfahan is safe and sound. Iran has been on high alert after Israel said it would respond to Iranian missiles and drones fired at Israel last Saturday night. The husband of former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has been charged in connection with the embezzlement of funds from the Scottish National Party. Peter Murrell was taken into custody yesterday and was questioned by Police Scotland detectives. He was previously arrested as a suspect in April last year before being released without charge. Donald Trump's labelled the hush money case against him a mess as a full jury of 12 have now been sworn in for the trial. Those on the jury include an English teacher, multiple lawyers and a software engineer. The former US president denies falsifying business records to pay an adult film star. Rishi Sunak is to call for an end to the sick note culture as he warns against over-medicalising the everyday challenges and worries of life. In a major speech on welfare reform later today, the Prime Minister wants to shift the focus to what people can do with the right support in place rather than what they can't do. A woman's been jailed for 14 weeks for stalking Harry Styles. 
35-year-old Myra Carvalho, who was staying at a hostel in southwest London, is said to have sent the former One Direction singer 8,000 cards in less than a month. She's been issued with a restraining order and has been banned from seeing him for perform. Well, those are the headlines. I'll have another update in an hour's time. Back to you. Thank you very much indeed, Miranda. Now we begin with that breaking news from the Middle East, where early reports suggest Israel may have carried out an operation in Iran following the drone and missile attack last weekend. But Iranian state media is downplaying the seriousness, saying three drones were intercepted by its air defence systems over the province of Isfahan. Well, Lord Richard Dunnett is a former chief of the general staff of the British Army and joins us now. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, this is a very fast-moving situation. Uh, very many concerns about escalation in the region. What's your reading of what you're hearing and the various bits of intelligence that we're now getting? Well, good morning. I suppose it's not a great surprise that notwithstanding the calls for restraint that um, have been echoing around and being delivered by international statesmen visiting Israel over the last few days, that uh, Israel has decided to retaliate in some shape or form following the attacks of uh, Saturday, uh, Sunday, uh, last weekend. Um, of course, we, we don't know. Um, we're all following the news media at the present moment to see what is actually being reported. But what it would seem is that uh, Israel uh, has retaliated, but in a fairly modest and moderate way. Um, of course, that's an initial assessment. We may find that there are successive waves of drones uh, and missiles coming in. But um, if, as it, as it would seem, that they are retaliating in principle with a small number of missiles. It's probably uh, Netanyahu making the point that um, no one's going to tell him what to do. And if he chooses to retaliate, he will. But um, he may well have listened to the messages of restraint uh, and therefore be retaliating in a modest way, but just to make the point that no one messes with Israel. Uh, Lord Dannett, there was also a very stark warning from Iran this week, wasn't there, that they had their finger on the trigger. If Israel were to attack their nuclear facilities, then Israel would, uh, Iran rather, would rethink its uh, nuclear stance. Um, the IAEA confirming at uh, this morning no damage to Iran's nuclear sites, which is significant, isn't it? Well, it is. Um, it would be a major escalation uh, if Israel had chosen to strike uh, any of the Iranian nuclear facilities. I think I think we'd all recognise, um, in whatever conflict it is, that if you strike another country's nuclear capability, then you really are stepping things up. So I would be surprised, and very disappointed and very worried, if it turned out that they had attacked a nuclear facility. But I'm, as I said a moment or two ago, I'm less surprised that notwithstanding the calls of restraint that uh, Israel has retaliated, I think to make the point that um, it, it's... It, it intended to, uh, and it has, but um, if it turns out that their attacks are moderate, then it may be part of drawing a line uh, under this um, chapter of um, tit-for-tat strikes, which started on the 1st of April in Damascus, and then last weekend, uh, and, and now something else. Um, again, I think it's one of the wider points about this conflict is that it's certainly not in Iran's interest to precipitate uh, a major conflict, a major conflict not so much with Israel, but with the United States uh, and other Western countries. Um, yes, we all know that Iran is the sponsor of Hamas, the Houthis, Hezbollah. So Iran can dial this up or dial this down. But I think most people would agree that it's not actually in Iran's interest to precipitate a major attack or a major conflict. Um, so I think we watch with interest and hope very much that this is a moderate retaliation by Israel and not the precursor to something more fundamental. And we believe that Israel warned the United States before launching this, this strike. Also, Netanyahu, very strong actually with David Cameron, saying that it is up to Israel how to respond, not up to the United Kingdom. Do you think that given this strike was limited, as we've heard, that there is no damage to Iran's nuclear sites, do you think that this will draw a line under the current conflict? Well, um, of course, we don't know. Um, I think one can hope that it will. Um, as I said just now, I don't think it's uh, in Iran's uh, wider interest or in, in, in Iran's interest to have a wider conflict, particular co conflict with uh, the United States. And we have to remember that... Um, Iran's regime is not as stable as 
they would like it to be. There is considerable opposition within uh, Iran, uh, and therefore they have to an extent uh, think about their own domestic pub public opinion. So I think uh, I would like to hope that what started on the 1st of, of April in Damascus continued last weekend in a massive way, but um, uh, was neutralized by the Israeli defenses and of course with international support, that this retaliation does indeed draw a line on it, uh, uh, draw a line under it. It would be in everyone's interest in that wider region if that indeed was the case. Uh, new sanctions have also been announced uh, on Iran, specifically targeting the defence sector, military uh, and uh, aircraft and missile manufacturing uh, facilities. Will they make any difference? Do sanctions work? Well, um, announcing sanctions is is a measure of, 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 of some, I can say, effect. I think it, you can only see the effect when actually um, some things that were going on stop. But... Um, Putting sanctions on Iran is not an unreasonable thing to do, particularly not just in the context of what's going on in the Middle East, but the fact that uh, Iranian missiles have been supplied and are being used against the Ukrainians. So there are um, connections here between not just the Middle East, but actually what's going on in Ukraine as well. Now, whether, if, whether sanctions are effective, that's really down to individual countries, uh, individual companies, whether they uh, abide by those sanctions. But um, uh, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a surprising thing that further sanctions have been slapped on Iran. Whether they're effective, I think only time will tell. Uh, I wonder if you have a view on Qatar. Qatar saying it's reassessing its role as a mediator between Israel and Hamas. Uh, this is uh, essentially they're saying they felt exploited and abused and being undermined by those trying to score political points. Uh, Qatar is crucial in these negotiations, isn't it? Um, hitherto it has been. Um, Qatar is a, an interesting country. It's, as we know, it's extraordinarily rich. It's got uh, a great wealth, which gives it a certain degree of confidence. And that has placed it um, outside uh, other groupings. Um, it sort of stands apart from Saudi Arabia, stands apart from the UAE, it stands apart from Egypt, um, and does its own thing, and has been quite content to be the centre uh, of other international negotiations. Uh, we saw Qatar played a role when uh, Donald Trump, uh, a number of years ago, had a bilateral uh, negotiation with the Taliban, which led to the eventual US withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, and Qatar has, I think, quite enjoyed the prominence of being the international home of the Hamas leadership. But I think by the reports that one's heard in the last few days, uh, they are feeling frustrated um, and perhaps a little bit embarrassed that uh, the apparent influence and leadership that they were trying to give out to the world that they were exerting doesn't actually turn out to have been the case. Uh, if it had been the case, then I think we would have seen some form of negotiated ceasefire, whether a long ceasefire or a pause uh, in Gaza before. So I think um, the Qataris are feeling, yeah, as they say, abused. I think they're feeling fed up that um, um, they've been made a bit of a fool of. Uh, meanwhile, um... The situation in Gaza, which we haven't even mentioned mm. yet, because, of course, we are all distracted by uh, the picture in Iran. Uh, where are we in terms of Israel's planned offensive on Rafa? Warnings from the United States not to attack Rafa, the US denying uh, that they had issued the green light if Israel were to exercise uh, restraint over Iran uh, for them to attack uh, Rafa. What is the situation now? on the ground in terms well, I think of if you just reflect on the comment uh, or the question you asked me a few moments ago uh, Netanyahu's attitude when David Cameron um, called for restraint with regard to Iran uh, the fact of the matter is that Israel will pretty much do what Israel wants to do and Netanyahu is determined to see through the strategic objective of destroying Hamas and therefore it's almost entirely logical that at some point we may be reaching that point quite soon now that Israeli forces are going to go into Rafah to root out, as they would see it, the last stronghold uh, of, of Hamas. The problem, of course, comes, and it's the problem that we've seen for the last six, seven months, is that Rafah is a highly populated area, just as the whole of Gaza has been. And this underlines the difficulties of carrying out an operation against terrorists, as they would, as they would see them, and I think that's a, a reasonable description, uh, in an area that's highly densely populated with other people. So um, I suspect that they will go into Rafa, um, almost irrespective of what the Americans have or have not said. 
But the way the Israelis need to um, pay attention to international opinion is to make sure that at the same time, into other parts of Gaza, sufficient aid gets in to, frankly, to make sure that the rest of the people in Gaza do not suffer adversely for the lack of food and fuel and medicines. Um, I think the Israelis otherwise lay themselves open to charges of genocide if they continue to block off uh, life-giving and life-saving aid to the Gazan population. Thank you very much indeed, Lord Dannett. Uh, let's move on and take another look at some of this morning's front pages now. In the mail, Nicola Sturgeon's husband, Peter Murrell, has been charged over the alleged embezzlement of SNP funds. The Mirror has an exclusive interview with Mark Menzies' former aide, Katie Fieldhouse, who claims she warned the chief whip after the filed MP made a 3am call to her requesting £5,000. And The Times leads with the Prime Minister's crackdown on sick note culture as GPs lose the right to sign patients off work. Well, let's stick with that story now as the Prime Minister calls for an end to sick note culture and warns against over-medicalising the everyday challenges and worries of life in a major speech on welfare reform later this morning. Rishi Sunak will say the focus must shift to what work people might be able to do. Amid government concerns, some are being unnecessarily written off as sick and parked on welfare. Well, we're now joined by our political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald, and Times Radio presenter James Hansen. Good morning to the two of Good you. Good morning. Uh, Alicia, this is uh, over many of the papers this morning, front page of the Daily Telegraph. Rishi Sunak very much on the front foot, trying to capture the public's imagination, and he thinks this is a vote winner. He does, and this is something the Conservative Party have been really trying to bring into their remit for quite some time now. It's just a month after the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride, came under quite a lot of fire for basically saying that lots of people who were just struggling with the everyday challenges of life were potentially saying they had depression and mental health problems. And he came um, under a lot of fire for that. But this is very much another rung of the same ladder for the Conservative Party. It's all about productivity. It's all about getting people back into work and weaning people away from what they say is an overly generous benefit system. Uh, it all comes down to the details, as always, mm -hmm. though, uh, James, doesn't it? Uh, we don't really know the specifics of how this is actually going to work. We don't. What, what's being kind of trailed in the papers this morning is this idea that sick notes, as opposed to being prescribed by a GP, may be given out by specialist assessors instead. Mm -hmm. There is a suggestion that GPs, it's too easy maybe for a GP to think. If someone comes to you and they're complaining about problems with their mental health, for example, to go, OK, I'll sign you off work. And actually, is there a better way of doing those assessments? But you're right, we need to see the details later from mm -hmm. Rishi Sunak. But clearly, if you look at how the out-of-work benefits bill has risen over the past 10 years, you know, we now spend more on out-of-work benefits than we do on schools, for instance. The government, at a time when there that's is a, a pretty huge... Stark, that's figure, huge. Isn't it? yeah, yeah, it's a huge amount of money. Mm. At a time when the government is looking at ways to save money, you know, particularly with potentially a manifesto commitment coming to increase defence spending, well, how are you going to pay for that? You can mm. pay for it one of three ways. You raise taxes. The Tories don't want to do that because already the tax burden's incredibly high. Borrowing. No government really at the moment wants to commit to more borrowing. Or you have to reduce spending elsewhere. And there is a sense in the Conservative Party, at least, that the welfare budget is somewhere they can look to make savings. And, Alicia, this comes on the back, of course, of dire polling results for the Conservative Party. Rishi Sunak really hoping that this was going to be a golden nugget for him. But when you look at the latest polling, this is Ipsos uh, for the Evening Standard, this is a 25-point lead for Labour. The Conservatives at their lowest since, what, 1978? It's really interesting. And every time there's another really bad poll for the Conservatives, which there have just been a stream of and they seem to be getting worse, I feel like we all keep saying, you know, is is this going to turn it around? Is this going to be the thing that suddenly changes their fates? And it just seems that it is just too late for that, really. It seems that lots of people have made their mind up about this Conservative government and have decided that it's it's not what they want um, come the next general election. And that poll definitely proves that sentiment in the country. And with this announcement, the Prime Minister trying to get on the front foot, as we said, and away from the less palatable headlines that they're currently enjoying, not least of all, uh, about Tory MP Mark Menzies. Really interesting story and, and, and quite a strange story as well. It's a situation where an MP has ended up in a situation where he has potentially been compromised and then what seems like blackmail afterwards. And it does seem like there is a bit of a parallel there with the Westminster honey trap story that we heard 
matter of weeks ago, maybe even last week, I can't remember, it's all blurry into one. <laughs> um, but it, it's these situations where MPs are ending up in compromising positions and then mm. effectively being blackmailed at the end of it. And obviously, Mark Menzies denies all of these allegations totally and says that he didn't use party funds. But what he hasn't denied is being in a situation that is a bit odd, effectively. He said that he was lock, locked in a flat and then found that he, he emergency needed five grand to get himself out of flat. I mean, That's how do you end in up morning. in that situation? That's the dubious part of this. And, and James, for Rishi Sunak, he must think, here we go again, yet yeah. another story. I'm trying so hard to actually control the political narrative, and yet his members of parliament seem to be letting him down. Well, Rishi Sunak will be banging his head against a brick wall because the government actually have had some positive economic data this week. Inflation has fallen. That is what we should be talking about. And yes, here we are talking about another Conservative MP in the headlines for the wrong reasons. We've had Liz Truss dominating proceedings this week with her new book as well, so we can't escape the shadow of his predecessor. Every time the government tries to tell a positive story, something else crops up. Yeah, and, and it does keep cropping up because I think we were talking in the last hour, there are... 18 independent MPs yeah. uh, currently sitting who are there for one reason or another, but various misdemeanours. They're not all Tories, but predominantly this feels like it's affecting the Tories. It does. It's just been a wipeout of Conservative MPs um, between the last election and now. I mean, the numbers are dwindling massively. Um, and obviously with Will Ragg, for example, obviously the Westminster honey trap story impacting him, mm. he chose to resign the whip. But that's not the case all the time, often it's getting to a situation where an MP is having the Conservative title forcibly taken away from them. And not just Conservative MPs, it's important to stress, but the majority of them are at the moment. And, and it's interesting, isn't it, James? No one's talking about Angela Rayner today. We've been talking about her for the last few weeks, and we're all focusing back on the Conservative Party as well. Just in terms of, of Rishi Sunak, mm -hmm. does he go now? Does he just say, after the local elections in two weeks' time, and who knows what the results are, does he just say, we go to the electorate now, or is it a case of the party will go to him and say, you're off? Well, I have always thought that if you're Rishi Sunak, you may as well spend that much longer in Downing Street because, you know, if it's your lifetime ambition to be Prime Minister, why would you end your time You've six the sofa. months early? You might as well. <laughs> and also, it. you know, you're going to lose terribly now. You may not lose as bad in six months' time because who knows what may happen. Yeah. But I think the interesting thing is, if the local election results are so bad for the Conservatives that Rishi Sunak fears a plot to oust him, he may decide in that moment of sort of defensiveness to call an election then, but I still think we're looking at the autumn. And also there's more polling out, isn't there, saying that actually a change of leader wouldn't actually change the fortunes of the Conservative Party. So it's not actually about Rishi Sunak. Is it actually its time? And the country often does this, doesn't it? It goes through cyclical changes. It's interesting because Rishi Sunak is not a popular Conservative Party leader at all. I mean, we keep hearing polls saying that, that, that he's at the level of where Liz Truss was when things went pretty badly after that mini-budget, and, and obviously her polling was, was pretty low then. So he's not super popular. However, there are lots of people who definitely don't think he should be the Prime Minister, definitely don't support him, but still think that having another change of leader before an election would send a worse signal to the public. The Ipsos poll we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier also found that Keir Starmer's personal poll ratings have fallen to the lowest since he became Labour leader. That's not yeah. good timing for him. And this is the interesting thing. A lot of people are comparing where we are now with 1997 because they think there could be a big Labour landslide coming. The big difference there is that actually, A, because of the economy, there was more of a feel-good factor in Britain mm -hmm. generally, and also Tony Blair was personally very popular in a way that Keir Starmer just isn't. If he does win a big majority next time round, it won't so much be a vote for the Labour Party and Keir Starmer, it'll probably be a vote against the Conservative Party. And that's what we're also hearing from people when they're asked how they're going to vote. About 47% say they have decided how to vote. The other 50% or thereabouts actually don't know how they'll vote. Yeah. Why hasn't Keir Starmer got that cut through? What is it about him that the public just don't seem to get? Well, look, he's not necessarily the world's most charismatic performer, orator. He would try and sell himself as a kind of steady, stable leader, almost in a kind of Theresa May mould. But I was then we. Say, I've heard that before. Exactly. Look, <laughs> yeah. look how that Strong. turned out. Yeah. You know, some would say that given the pyrotechnics of the Boris Johnson years and then Liz Truss's very brief stint in Downing Street, maybe a bit of stability is what we need. But that also is Rishi Sunak's appeal. That's how he tried to sell himself. The grown ups are back in charge. And people have had 18 months of Rishi Sunak in Downing Street or thereabouts, and they think, well, actually, maybe we want a few pyrotechnics. So it's difficult, isn't it? People always yearn for, for the other thing. When you, get a, Boris Johnson, yeah. Yeah. When you get a Boris Johnson type figure, people go, oh, can't we have someone a bit dull and competent? And then you get someone <laughs> dull and competent, people go, oh, can't we have someone exciting again?
Uh, on the subject of the grass is always greener, the European Commission proposing uh, changing some, an olive branch post-Brexit mm. to allow some young people under 30s to be able to go and spend time in an EU country. Yes, this was because in the wake of Brexit, obviously the free movement um, agreement that we had with EU countries was obviously uh, collapsed in the wake of Brexit. Mm. And it's, it now means it's really quite difficult for people to work abroad um, in a way that it wasn't so difficult before Brexit. So this is definitely an olive branch from the EU trying to say that we we want a little bit of what we had before without having any of the, the kind of format. Oh, so now they want to play nicely, <laughs> do they? James, just in terms of that, the EU is saying, oh, well, we can do a deal with the United Kingdom. What does that do for Starmer? Because the UK government is saying, actually, we already do deals with young people yeah. from other countries, and we're not going to negotiate with the EU as a whole. Now, Starmer is in a tricky place here, yeah. because if he says, yes, we embrace the EU, that shows his colours, doesn't it? He doesn't want the issue of the EU to crop up at <laughs> all in the election campaign. However, once the election is done, let's assume he wins and he's in Downing Street, there probably will be, over time, some shifts towards a little bit more cooperation with the EU. I'm not saying, for example, he's going to turn around and say we're going to mm. join the customs union suddenly, but you never know. That could be the long-term direction of travel. Mm. It's fascinating, isn't it, just in terms of, of how this is morphing. Would you agree with that, that actually the last thing that Starmer wants is yeah. any mention of the EU at all before we get to polling day? Definitely, because for so long, I mean, people will remember, if, if HC campaigned, obviously, to, to rejoin the EU slash remain in the EU at the time, and then suddenly was like, oh, no, no, we don't want to rejoin the EU, we're fine, we're going we're gonna to carry on as is. And then it had lots of people questioning what his actual belief on it was. Mm. So he really tried to quiet that for so long long um, uh, but it's definitely going to keep cropping up and of I course mean, we saw years. the natcon conference didn't we disrupted of course other noises off from the um from the conservative party as well so rishi sunat not having a great time nor starmer at the moment uh, alicia james thank you both very much indeed still to come here on talk today sunak abandons his plans for a rwanda flight in spring and Tradesmen and women take a £14,000 hit to their turnover in the last year. Well, broadcaster Nikki Hodgson and former political advisor Leon Emirali are here to take us through this morning's papers. This is Talk Today. The time is 7.24. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 7.27. We'll have the weather in just a moment. But here's what else is coming up in the programme. Biden's big claims questions whether there's any truth in the president's story that a cannibal ate his uncle. That's in the papers next. Should nicotine patches be offered to children who vape? That is what health officials are calling for. We'll discuss this just after eight. And a royal return. Prince William is back at work after his wife's cancer diagnosis. We'll discuss this a little later at around 9.20. First, though, Joe is here. And, Joe, what is the weather looking like for this weekend? It's, it's actually not looking too bad. I'm just a bit distracted by that story. <laughs> you know, would you not remember if a cannibal ate your uncle? Yeah. It's kind of... <laughs> oh, I missed that bit. Anyway, yes, promising you some better weather this weekend as high pressure starts to build out towards the west. It should be a little bit drier and clearer, but unfortunately, hand in hand with that, go some fairly chilly conditions as well. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, I think many of us would pay any price just to see some sunshine in. It does look as though skies are going to clear a little bit. It's down to this area of high pressure out towards the west. And as you can see, it doesn't really move very far across the weekend, even as we go into next week. But because it does shift a little bit, we get a different distribution of the cloud and at times a little bit of rain as well. So certainly for today, there is quite a lot of cloud around to start the day with some showery outbreaks of rain. It's also quite a chilly start over Scotland. Temperatures there are two degrees Celsius, higher elsewhere where we've got more in the way of cloud. And along eastern coast, we've got a very brisk northerly wind. So it is going to feel very cold there, particularly as temperatures through the day are likely to stay in single figures for those areas. Elsewhere, though, it's going to be a showery picture, th certainly through central, southeastern areas come the middle of the day. But in those brighter western areas, we'll see temperatures up to around 12 or 14 degrees Celsius. That's 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, as we go into this evening and overnight, we continue to see these uh, uh, skies clearing. But, of course, at that point, we also start to see the temperatures dropping. So overnight, we could see temperatures in quite a few places, low enough for a touch of frost, maybe in some areas even low enough for a few pockets of air frost. So uh, warnings to all the farmers and gardeners out there. But we'd also, also see a lovely bright start to Saturday. Good deal of sunshine through the course of the day with just a few showers cropping up. Now, again, it's going to be down to this northerly wind to drive some cloud into central areas. That's pushing its way westwards through the day, more in the way of cloud over Scotland. And here we are going to see some rain as well. But temperatures... 9 to 11 degrees Celsius for those northern areas, quite a bit higher further south. And it is a largely dry picture for much of England and Wales, much of Ireland as well. Once again, temperatures 13 or 14 degrees Celsius, but lower on those eastern coasts. And obviously with those strong winds, it is going to feel pretty bitter there as well. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thanks very much, Joe. Let's go through today's papers now with broadcaster Nikki Hodgson and former political advisor Leon Emirali. Leon, let's start with you, if we can. This is page 13 of The Mail. Rwanda, Rwanda, Rwanda. It's Rishi Sunak desperate for Rwanda, isn't he? And, of course, at the moment we're in parliamentary ping-pong. I, I thought it would go through this week. Obviously, mm. it hasn't gone mm. through this week. And he just wants to see, mm. like other prime ministers, he wants to see a plane uh, take off. How long have we been speaking about Rwanda? And 
how much longer we're going to have to. But, yeah, you're quite right. It's being held up in the Lords, and this is about the legislation that says, actually, Rwanda is a safe country to get past the, the ruling um, that, that it isn't. Uh, but the Lords aren't having much of it, and they are now having to, to, to delay things, and Rishi Sunak has been forced to abandon hopes of flights taking off in the spring. Now, this is a real headache for number 10, because as soon as a flight takes off, he can say, look, it's working, we're doing it, it's happening, but we're getting closer and closer to when the general election might be called, won't have enough time for, to have an impact, um, and it's just a big headache for Rishi Sunak, who's been trying to get this off the ground, but the Lords are not playing ball with him. No, and there are four amendments that have come back, including whether there should be exemptions for Afghans, Rwanda shouldn't be declared safe, which is basically the, the principle behind it until there's an independent monitoring. Don't ignore international law. This just carries on and on. This also, Nikki, um, he met with Paul Kagame. They say they can ramp it up, but I think the cost was £150 million per person who gets on that plane. It's an expensive play. Well, it's just getting more expensive by the day, isn't it? It's a bit like the debate about having refugees in hotels. I mean, the, <laughs> the problem with this is it is technically a breach of international law. And there are lots of people in this country that feel very strongly that whatever you think about uh, people that shouldn't be in this country, they shouldn't be sent back to somewhere that is very hostile to certain kinds of people. You know, we saw people protesting there and they were very badly beaten up as a result of it. It's very hostile to uh, gay people. They've actually, in fact, the Rwandan government has already said we won't take anybody who's gay. So I don't know. I mean, to me, that's like an obvious loophole for people. They're going to use that as a, mm. a get-out clause, or from anybody who genuinely is, they can't go for persecution. And the laws is actually the laws are actually doing their job right now. Their job is to keep pushing back on the government if they actually fundamentally believe something is not workable. The other problem I've got is I don't think necessarily the Rwanda policy is going to be the deterrent that they hope it will be because you know we're seeing migration. Migration is still rising despite this policy being on the table, despite uh, migrants who come here thinking that actually they might be on that flight anyway. So I don't think it's going to work. And it was never going to address the problem of net migration, no. was no. it? Which no. is and the amount of people they can take is so tiny compared to the number of yeah, people so that we are So we now are at 6,265 so far this year. But also the UK government is lining up other countries mm. as well mm. to replicate Rwanda. So this is what they're going to say. Rwanda works. Now we're going to move on to some other countries Which as well. Which baffles me, because, you know, the Rwanda process has not been easy. And maybe they're thinking, once they can pass this legislation, they've then got a blueprint, they've got a template... Well, and many of those countries are also looking to see how the Rwanda deal <laughs> of does work and out a lot, a before they'll commit. And others have said, no. don't even come near yeah. us. Mm. Um, let's uh, look at Nikki at The Guardian. And this is about Scotland's only clinic... Uh, to offer treatment to gender-questioning young people. They've paused prescribing puberty blockers. Yeah, so this is off the basis of the CAST review. Um, it's the only clinic in Scotland which currently uh, prescribes pu puberty blockers and uh, offers that kind of treatment to young people who are gender-questioning. And they are reluctantly saying we're going to pause treatment because the CAST review was just so very damning in the fact that there isn't any proof that these treatments actually work and that they're much more detrimental to young people than not. Um, I think what's sad about this whole debate is there are going to be lots of young people in England and Scotland right now whose futures seem very uncertain because they don't know what kind of support they can get. So, OK, fair enough if we take puberty blockers away. I'm, I'm not supportive of them myself. Um, but I'm very worried about a cohort of young, potentially, you know, trans people that will just be kind of left floundering. And they're caught in this horrible political debate. You know, their livelihoods and their futures are caught up in this huge debate. We need to have this debate because, actually, we don't really understand the science problem. We don't actually know how to treat people. And it does feel that young people have been experimented on to some extent. Oh, well, I, I do worry about those young people. 100%. Who now just don't know and Cass was very clear about this. She yeah. said it's ideology over clinical evidence. She also said something we believe passionately in medicine first do no harm. Mm. We didn't know what we were doing, or those clinics didn't know what they were doing. And children grow and develop and, and change emotionally in, in, in terms of maturity. Absolutely. And I think we're going to look back actually at this period, maybe in 10 years' time, and think how on earth were we prescribing yeah. puberty blockers to these, to these, to these young people? And, and I do think, you know. You're quite right. There's so much political division wrapped up in this topic, but there is a small number of people who go through this and it's a real ordeal for them. And the fact that they haven't been able to be treated properly, yeah. I think, is scandalous. Uh, and now I'm glad that we're starting to wake up to, to what actually should be going on when people you know, mm. say, I'm not sure about my gender, I'm starting to question who I am, yeah. then they have the right solution to that. But you can't solve a, a mental problem with, with, with physical remedies, and I think that's the problem with puberty blockers. Uh, and this clinic had come under a lot of pressure because it hadn't immediately followed NHS England in 
installing this uh, ban on puberty blockers in uh, teenagers. Nikki, should we have a look at the Times? Uh, this is about universities yes. and their reliance on overseas students' income from countries like China. Yeah, I mean, we, we know that our British universities are propped up by foreign students coming in. We rely on their fees to uh, subsidise our own. And Oliver Dowden, the Deputy Prime Minister, has come out and said he's actually really worried about universities because they are effectively a gap in the national security armour when they're taking students from countries where maybe their politics are not in agreement with our own, like China. But I think that's my own time at university in York. And actually, Chinese students were the bedrock of our university in terms of funding. But they were often very distant from the rest of the students. We didn't really have relationships with them. They had their own societies. They kind of lived amongst themselves. I even lived with a Chinese graduate in my final year of university. And my, me and my boyfriend at the time were convinced she was a spy. We just we just, presu we just come from, from working out why she was there and what she did. But you make so, a great point, though, about being very culturally distinct yeah. at university. And, of course, the university is going after cash. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. they want. Yeah, and the UK doesn't export much these days. But one thing we do export a lot of is education, yeah. uh, in, in a way. You know, it is an export because we have these students coming here paying into the UK economy. But the Chinese question is an interesting one. I spent six months living in China when I was a university student on an exchange and the Chinese students treated me as if I was a spy. So there is this sort of, <laughs> there is this sort of suspicion, I think, between, between the yeah. two. And in, in, in a way, it's great for cultural understanding and everything else, but I think there has to be a, a balance, isn't there? So but the UK universities will out. also say we need that mm. money. I mean, there was a big mm. report earlier this year, wasn't there, about whether or not degree offers are lower for those who are yes. coming in from abroad because they bring in the cash yeah. that those universities desperately need what's the answer yeah and we give you them shut your doors. they bring cash we give them cash i mean it's just one of those mm -hmm. symbiotic relationships but i think actually more interesting as as our relationship with china gets more heated what pressure will china and chinese students put on our democracy universities our free speech I don't think we've anticipated that yet. No. Let's move on, Leon, and talk about uh, Joe Biden, because he, he is legendary for some of the tales that he has told. The headline here is Biden tells the tallest of tales, as he implies cannibals <laughs> ate his uncle. Yes, you heard that right. <laughs> this, is, this is a great story. So, so Joe Biden, who, who loves a, a story or two, uh, perhaps with the odd exaggeration, this one is one of them. So he says his <laughs> uncle was flying over what is now uh, Papua New Guinea, um, crashed his plane right. and was eaten by cannibals. It turns out, <laughs> it turns out, <laughs> Joe Biden's uncle was not even flying a plane, nor was it shot down. So I don't know <laughs> whether this was a dream, perhaps, the president had and then thought he would tell the world about it. Um, but it's a great story. Uh, we've all, we're all partial to a bit of embellishment every now and then to entertain our friends. <laughs> so do we know what happened to Uncle Bozy? We don't. Or Uncle, Poor Uncle Bozy. Yes. It sounds like one of those family myths. You know, we all yes, have one of those stories down. that don't we, from that somebody said about <laughs> yeah, our yeah, great yeah, uncle was this. Yeah. My, everybody used to tell me in our family that, that we were German and we'd, 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 we didn't want to join the Nazis, so we came over. Turned out that was a load of tosh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I did my 23 and me, I found out we'd never been anywhere near Germany. So, I mean, everybody's got these myths in their family, but they don't, they're not all president. No, they're not all supposed to be leader of the free world uh, purporting to spread truth. No, <laughs> on no, no, no. His aides make of this. They must be sort of wringing their, not their head again. in their hands. It's, it's, just, it's yeah. Biden making another gaffe, isn't yes, it? And if the you're, leader of the free world. If yeah. you're Donald Trump or you're his political opponents and you're yes. using this line that yeah. he's got dementia, he's not all there with it cognitively, and he comes out with this absolute tosh, yeah. it's, it doesn't I mean, play to well. Me, yeah, he was only a toddler when his uncle mm. apparently died. Maybe that was the story that he was told. Well, maybe it was. <laughs> maybe it was. Maybe a it was lovely easier, bedtime yeah. story for you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Eaten by cannibals. Yeah. Not, yes. not very child-friendly. Yeah. Sweet no. dreams. <laughs> um, Nikki, shall we uh, have another look at uh, another story in The Sun? And this is about <laughs> tradesmen and women taking a big hit when it comes to their <coughs> earnings. Well, apparently they've taken a massive £14,000 hit in the past year from 2022 to 2023. Uh, but I can't feel too sorry for them because the amount of money they're making, I had no idea. I mean, I know tradespeople are always pretty well paid, but we're saying builders are, are, are on £114,000 a year. Um, Glaziers, £99,000. 
Rufus, 81,000. I'm absolutely in the wrong, in the wrong job. But I mean, that, no proves, that proves you whatsoever. don't need to go to university. <laughs> yeah. We need yes. to actually push absolutely. people into trades. 100%. Absolutely. Although, actually, me and Leon were saying, they're complaining that there's no work for them because people are saving money. They don't want to make home renovations because of the cost of living crisis. I can't get a tradesperson to do anything. My oven's been well, broken since the November. The cost of supplies <laughs> like, has gone fixed. up massively, so yes. your bills are going to go yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Your uh, oven's been broken since oven's, November. I know, that says a lot what about me. What are you eating? <laughs> we still got Air a hob. I want to say We've still got other appliances, but um, yeah. yeah, it's not very good. Well, I've been trying to get a window cleaner for the past few weeks. <laughs> I, I get, I get a booking. Do it yourself. And, and then, and then, and then, and then, it's too windy. It's too you wet. You can't do the top windows by yourself. No, can't That's do the top dangerous. windows. But, no. Uh, no, I think it's, it's astonishing. But David's right. You can make a good living very much without so. having to go through university, without having an office job. Learn a trade, and if you set, set up your own business, I mean, my goodness, those numbers are very impressive. And very it goes good. back to Tony Blair saying 50% of people should go to university. Why? No one's actually ever yeah. countered that argument. Mm. No. And of course, that links beautifully back to the China story. Yes, mm. absolutely. Too many universities. Yeah. Yeah. You walk out saddled with debt uh, when you go to university. <laughs> I'm still paying my student loan. <laughs> you, you probably, do, you, pro you know, you, you end up not earning as much as that, and you could, no. you could be doing it a much better way. There's, there is an alternative. You could. Somebody who needs to up his earnings. Yes. Uh, an American tourist. Who returned from a trip to Europe, Leon? Yes. He had a pretty almighty bill to pay. He did. So he was in uh, he was in Europe and he was charged one hundred and forty three thousand dollars. <laughs> That's one hundred and fifteen thousand uh, pounds for mobile phone charges using his what? phone overseas. An and oh, um, he, doing? he spoke to T-Mobile, uh, who was his provider, yep. and luckily they said that they will wipe that bill for him. However, it does show you the perils, doesn't it, of using your phone abroad? And it reminds me a little bit of Michael Matheson, Tory, uh, sorry, not Tory, oh, SNP yes. minister, who was abroad um, and he said his sons were watching football. football he had an 11,000 yeah. pound bill that he tried to recharge to the tax. Right. But where was the <laughs> onus here on the operator? Because obviously they could see that he was racking up these debts. Mm. Surely there should be a cap on those things. You'd have thought so, but he hadn't set up his phone properly. So he, he, you can set a cap that says, if it goes over this limit, you know, count me out. But he didn't, so it just kept going and going and going, and then eventually he came this home. This is everybody's worst nightmare. Traveling, traveling, isn't he it? had gone into a mobile phone store before he, he travelled to did. tell yeah. them about his plans. So and really, then, yeah, it really is on them then. The only wow. Yeah, but it's always worrying. Even now, you know, I, I, when you come off the plane, always, <laughs> I know, you it was, you was worry. You think, am I going to get charged? Hundred percent. You yeah. watch for the text message that <laughs> yeah. says how yeah. much yeah. their calls are going to yeah. be and yeah. whether Absolutely. you're capped on data. Talking of phones, yeah. you and I were talking about this earlier. Earlier, a quarter of children have something, Nikki, and I'm absolutely shocked. I'm this. absolutely aghast by this story. Yes, a quarter of seven-year-olds have a smartphone. Children as young as three, four, and five have smartphones. Why? Who are, I'm sorry, Why? but who are these parents giving their children smartphones, you know? I mean, what's terrifying is my daughter's 14 months old. She already knows how to swipe on my phone. It's it's extremely... Uh, in, uh, they, it's implicit in the to technology. Go over to a TV screen yes, and try it's, and, and it's, swipe. It's, yes. it's, and you have to buy them fake remotes and all the rest of it. And it's very, very disturbing to me that that's yeah. what... They, they just want to be around tech. But it's up to me as a parent to not let her have it. Mm. So, you know, the fact that it, we talk so much about the safety of children on social mm. media. Mm. If you have a young child that is using a smartphone, they can be privy to all kinds of people messaging them for the wrong reasons. And the images and the information they can see is completely unsuitable. Please take smartphones off there little is a, children. There is a, a growing call, isn't there, for parents to actually come together. Yeah. And not give their children smartphones mm. too early because it's a slippery slope mm. once one or two in the class have got it. I mean, my son is 11, nearly 12. He still has a brick. Yeah. Mm. And he may not like it, but I know that I'm keeping him as safe as Absolutely. possible. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose yeah. that battle yeah. eventually, but the longer I can protect him, yeah. the better Completely, I completely, I completely agree. And, the, you know, the very thing about this is the people that create this technology don't let their own children use uh, it. That's no. everything you need to know. Yes, it That's is. What That's what I tell really them as well. That's a really good point, really good point. Thank you very much indeed to Leon and Nikki. They'll be back with more papers in just under an hour. Uh, lots of you have been getting in touch with us this morning with your views and opinions. We've been asking, uh, Rishi Sunak has vowed to crack down on sick note Britain. Should GPs lose the right to sign patients off work? Would it be effective? Uh, Lauren says, our productivity per person is amongst the worst in Europe. Something needed to be done urgently to bring people back to work. I never thought I would say this, <laughs> but well done, Rishi. Mm, we're also asking, when do you want this general election? Should we have it now or should we wait? Peter said, the sooner the election, the sooner later. Labour gets in, and the sooner England goes from being ruined to being diabolically destroyed. I still can't believe that. This is the current state of our politics and politicians. The whole thing is 
pathetic. And Dilip, I can't wait to get rid of the Tories, but it's not Labour either. This time I'm going for an <laughs> independent candidate who would look after us locally. And William says, why prolong the agony any longer? Give the country the chance to vote for a change. We need an early chance to recover from several failures created by the two major traditional parties over the last few years. Decades. And John says, where can I go and scream? There is no one worth voting for in capitals. <laughs> <laughs> Keep those impassioned thoughts uh, coming into us. Talk today at talk.tv. You can tweet us at talk.tv or you can send us a text. Text the word talk and your message to 87 travel 2 Plenty more still to come, though, on the programme, including Sam Mellard with the sports. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Coming up, Liverpool crash out of the Europa League as Klopp's reign as manager reaches its end. Emma Raducanu's comeback continues as she reaches the Stuttgart Open quarterfinal. And Lewis Hamilton, he insists he has no intention of slowing down, saying he plans to race well into his 40s. This is Talk Today. A very good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 7.50, the sport now, and Liverpool are out of the Europa League after a 3-1 aggregate defeat to Atalanta. Uh, Jurgen Klopp's final European game in charge of the club ended in disappointment as they failed to overturn their first leg defeat, entering the game 3-0 down after last week's defeat at Anfield. Honestly, Sam, that makes no sense Sorry, to me whatsoever. Um, <laughs> We're off to a good Tell start. Tell us more. Tell us more. On a Friday. Yeah. Um, so, two-legged tie in the quarterfinals. Yes. Liverpool lost the first one 3-0. So last night they needed to do something pretty special to turn around. They actually got off to the perfect start. They went up 1-0 very, very early on. And you then think Liverpool, their history, their heritage, have got 
a great tradition of, of, of overcoming some big, big deficits wasn't to be. The game ended up finishing 1-0. I have no idea how over 180 minutes Liverpool <laughs> have ended up losing. I don't know how many Atalanta fans you have listening to this show. If you have a lot, I don't want to offend you, but they're not very good at football. <laughs> Liverpool absolutely hammered Atalanta last night. And they somehow only ended up winning 1-0. And it has been a, a terrible, terrible couple of weeks for Jurgen Klopp and Liverpool. They got knocked out of the mm. FA Cup by Manchester United. They then dropped points in the Premier League at Manchester United, lost to Crystal Palace, are now out of the Europa League. And we're entering a real distinct possibility now where Liverpool aren't going to win another trophy. It's just the Premier League now, two points behind Manchester City. And Jurgen Klopp's time at Liverpool mm. is going to end. Well, he's with not just... bowing out in the way no, that anyone would have wanted. Three weeks ago, Sarah, we're sitting here... And we're talking about a quadruple, thinking yeah. Yeah. they've got a chance of it. Don't get me wrong, that's obviously really unlikely to win four trophies. But I really thought the Europa League so, was so a So what is this about? Is it pressure, do you think? Is that why they're not performing? Do you know what? I, I don't think it's down to pressure. I think some people are trying to link it to Klopp leaving and saying mm. it's been a distraction. I'm, I'm, I think that's a real sort of easy, lazy... Cop out. Yeah, 100%. Mm. Because I think when, when he first announced it... Liverpool went on a really, really good run and people went, that's oh, a stroke of genius, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They're going to be, everyone's going to be united. Um, I think for me, and this, this also, to be fair, some people might say an easy excuse, they look really, really tired. Liverpool have had a lot of injuries this season and some of the players that haven't been injured look leggy, look tired. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that have been injured are just coming back. It's taken them maybe a little while to get up to speed. So bad night for Liverpool. Also West Ham as well. They were knocked out of the same competition to buy Leverkusen. But we have one English team left in Europe. And that's Aston Villa through to their first European semi-final since 1972. They won on penalties last night against Lille. It finished 3-3 on aggregate. Great scenes through. So four English teams this week, including Arsenal Man City, out. The mighty Aston Villa, they're through. Well done <laughs> to them. What season they're having. Um, Emma Raducanu, uh, it's Stuttgart Open, a better day for her. Yeah, really, really good day for her. Fair play to Emma Raducanu. It was great to see her, isn't it? Firstly, just fit and yes. healthy and on the tennis court. And she produced a very, very impressive performance, beating Linda Noshkova. She's in the last eight of the Stuttgart Open, winning six love, seven five. Next up, though, the world number one and the defending champion, Iga Svintek, in the quarterfinal. She's down to... 303rd in the world rankings, which sounds quite crazy to think when yeah. you think she won a major Absolutely. tournament only a few years ago. But we know she's had big injuries. Uh, we know she spent a lot of time on the sidelines, but she seems to be really enjoying her tennis. She's got a big smile on her face. I Good. think it's tennis, tennis, tennis now. And let's hope she can get back to her best, Sarah. That's the point, isn't it? Enjoying her tennis because she came under so much pressure and so yeah. much scrutiny. Yeah, it must be hard though, age. right, Sarah, to be so young and have that kind of level of fame being thrown at you. <laughs> That's a long time ago. <laughs> can you, can you, can you, what's it like though to be so famous? So exactly. Don't, 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 don't be bothered, Sarah. You know, you're a, oh, you you're a teenage out. sensation as well yourself, but no. Uh, Shall we move on and talk about the FA Cup Ooh, replays? Bullies. Because I was reading about this and, and I was a little confused at the time, but we were just talking about this. Yeah. This is a big problem, actually, for smaller clubs. Yeah, big, big problem. And it's caused a lot of controversy this morning. FA Cup replays have been scrapped now from the first round onwards. Um, scrapping replays um, will allow more room for, for Premier League so fixtures just to be played. What that means. So replay is in the FA Cup. If you were to play a game in the first round and it was to be a 1 1 draw, you would then play it again at the other team. So the team that was away would go at home so that it'd be swapped around. Mm. Now it's going to simply be if you draw 1 1, it goes to extra time, it goes to penalties. The main reason why this is happening, guys, is the big teams, the elite teams, have got their way. They don't like playing replays. They don't like having to, to play another game. I mean, goodness gracious me, win the game then in the first place and you won't <laughs> yeah. have to play yes, it. Exactly. But we do know. It takes away those fantastic exactly, spectacles. Sarah. Do you know what? It? I hate the fact that football in this country and around the world is being changed. Next season, the Champions League format is being revamped. I like football the way it is. And part of the history and the tradition in this country the magic of is it. an FA Cup replay. We have some of the best moments, some of the most historic moments in one of the most famous competitions in the world coming from replays. But the big clubs, they're on busy schedules, the European games, mm -hmm. and the new European schedule next season, by the way, is going to include a couple of more extra games. So to make sure that can fit into the schedule in this country, Replays are going. And as Sarah rightly says, the big problem here is lower league clubs, they rely on these replays because the extra game through gate money, through TV mm. money, it's important for these teams. And also, it's part of the competition. It's part of how... There's something special, guys, about mm. a lower league team getting one of the big boys at home. And who knows, they might get a draw 
It's, and then it's an amazing moment for them. And then they've got a replay at Old Trafford and the Emirates to look forward to. It's part of the magic of the FA Cup. Mm. And it's being... Do you know what? One day, I swear to God... F it is what makes it. Do you know what? One day, do you know what's going to happen, Sarah? In 20 years' time, we'll get to a point where they'll go, do you know what? Let's just have the top eight teams play from the quarterfinals onwards. Of course onwards. They Let's will. just get rid of the, the lower league teams. They're an irrelevance, <laughs> aren't they? It's so important mm. in this country, right? As, as much as we love the big teams going deep in Europe, we have to protect... The, the whole of the EFL, yeah. and that's including... I, I the totally Portland agree, two, and you have so done a staunch defence of the smaller clubs, Sam. Thank you very much. And that is why Indeed. we love them. And that, absolutely. Feelings right. mutual, obviously. Uh, well, thank you very much, Sam. Uh, still to come, Downing Street says Israel has the right to defend itself. Following reports, Israel may have carried out a drone operation targeted at Iran overnight. We'll speak to a former Israeli member of parliament. That's next. This is Talk Today. Good morning to you. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah. Minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Sarah Hewson. A very good morning to you. It is 8 o'clock on Friday, the 19th of April. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Our top stories this morning. Middle East escalation. Breaking news this morning with reports Israel has been targeting Iran. In the last hour, Downing Street has said Israel has the right to defend itself after last weekend's attack. Sick note, Britain. The Prime Minister is calling for an end to sick note culture in a major sport. Speech on welfare reform. 
And should children who vape be given nicotine patches? We'll speak to the author behind a new report recommending the measure, and that's this hour. And we're looking at some brighter skies for the weekend, but it's not going to be particularly warm, especially on eastern coasts where there'll be a keen northerly wind. All the details coming up shortly. Now it's time for all your headlines with Miranda. Good morning. U.S. officials say Iran has been hit by an Israeli missile. Flights have been suspended over several cities and Iran's state-run news agency has said air defense batteries have been fired in several provinces. Iran's Tasnin news agency has posted these pictures of a nuclear facility in Isfahan, saying the city is safe and sound. Iran has been on high alert after Israel said it would respond to Iranian missiles and drones fired at Israel last Saturday night. Well, Lord Richard Dannett, a former chief of the general staff of the British Army, Army told us it seems a moderate response. As it would seem that they are retaliating in principle with a small number of missiles. It's probably uh, Netanyahu making the point that um, no one's going to tell him what to do. And if he chooses to retaliate, he will. The husband of former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has been charged in connection with the embezzlement of funds from the Scottish National Party. Peter Murrell was taken into custody yesterday and was questioned by police Scotland detectives. He was previously arrested as a suspect in April last year before being released without charge. Rishi Sunak is to call for an end to the sick note culture as he warns against over-medicalising the everyday challenges and worries of life. In a major speech on welfare reform later today, the Prime Minister wants to shift the focus to what people can do with the right support in place rather than what they can't do. Donald Trump says the hush money case against him is a mess, as a full jury of 12 have now been sworn in for the trial. Those on the jury include an English teacher, multiple lawyers and a software engineer. The former US president denies falsifying business records to pay an adult film star. And statues honouring the servicemen who died on D-Day have been installed in Normandy. 1,475 silhouettes of soldiers make up the Standing with Giants for Your Tomorrow installation at the British Normandy Memorial as part of the 80th anniversary. Well, those are the headlines. I'll have another update at nine. Thanks very much indeed, Miranda. Now we begin with that breaking news from the Middle East, where early reports suggest Israel may have carried out an operation in Iran following the drone and missile attack last weekend. So far, Israel has not released an official statement claiming responsibility, but Downing Street says it does have the right to defend itself. But Iranian state media is downplaying the seriousness, saying three drones were intercepted by its air defence systems over the province of Isfahan. Well, let's cross now to Tel Aviv, where former Israeli MP Ksenia Sletlova joins us. What are you hearing on the ground uh, from where you are? What are the latest developments? Good morning. Uh, so, first of all, I have to tell you that uh, there is this sense of satisfaction uh, in the Israeli political class. Uh, it seems that Netanyahu achieved what he wanted. He showed that he can retaliate. Uh, and he's not binded by uh, all of these pleads by his regional and international allies. But at the same time, he didn't want this uh, all-out war in the Middle East. It seems to be, from what we see from the Iranian uh, response, it's not about to happen, at least not now. Uh, there is no special alert in Israel. There is no emergency state uh, in Israel. People are just, you know, continuing with the Friday. It's a free day. Uh, cafes are full, people are outside, there is no sense of something dramatic happening. Yeah, the, the way you're describing this, it almost sounds like a, a sort of face-saving exercise for Benjamin Netanyahu to satisfy uh, domestically that he's not letting Iran get away with it, but, it, but also not being seen to escalate uh, this crisis. Do we see this as an escalation or a de-escalation, given how far this is from the sorts of things that were being talked about in the Israeli war cabinet? Well, absolutely. You know, first of all, uh, there are already a few responses by the most far-right ministers in Israel's cabinet uh, that they describe this uh, response as mute, 
not enough, uh, something that uh, will not satisfy the, me the need to really retaliate. These are the voices of the ministers, Bankvir and Smutrich, who were calling for a very harsh blow on Iran, even at the cost of starting a uh, regional war. Uh, it seems that the, the voices of the uh, most moderate parts of this coalition, meaning Minister of Defense, Benny Ga Mr. Minister of Defense, Joab Gallant, and also Minister Benny Gantz, uh, who supported some kind of uh, response, but I think that uh, given their good relations for both of them with the United States and other allies of Israel, uh, their voice, uh, you know, that was the decisive voice uh, in forming and shaping uh, this kind of uh, response to uh, the very outstanding uh, Iranian attack about a week ago on uh, Israeli cities. And of course, Benjamin Netanyahu, very clear with Lord Cameron that it is Israel's right to strike back. Uh, we now know there has been no damage to nuclear sites, according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, just in terms of uh, where we go. Uh, the uh, Iran now is saying it has no plan for immediate retaliation. Are you hoping this does actually draw a line under it? Because Israel has it or was seen to have to respond in some muted, measured way. Do you think that's the end to this? Well, I certainly hope that this is the end for this current episode uh, that started with the elimination uh, of uh, some Iranian generals uh, in the uh, diplomatic mission of uh, Iran in Damascus. Uh, but I do believe that uh, the hostility with Iran and uh, the ongoing war, it is a war. Uh, it is not the traditional war, but because it's happening between proxies and not necessarily the territory of either Israel or Iran, it will go on. And there are, of course, a lot of suspicions in Israel that Iran might want to break through uh, very soon with its nuclear program and escalate the enrichment of the uranium, given the threats that were flying in the air and understanding that perhaps this episode is over, but there can be another one soon. Uh, and that's the point, isn't it? I mean, the IAEA saying that uh, nuclear facilities in Iran are safe were not uh, targeted because it follows that very concerning warning from Iran this week. You attack our nuclear uh, facilities, uh, uh, we'll attack yours. That certainly would be an escalation and uh, an escalation that would have global impact. Well, the, the language on both sides uh, was uh, very uh, harsh and dramatic. Uh, and the Iranians, I just have to mention that uh, I think they admitted for the first time yesterday through one of their officials uh, that they are ready to change their nuclear mm. strategy. Uh, meaning if until now they claimed that, you know, it's all for the peaceful uh, purposes and so on, you know, the world did not believe them so much. But uh, then again, you know, they never admitted that they wanted the nuclear program for the military purposes. I think for the first time yesterday we heard from the Iranian official that was quoted in uh, AP and other news agencies that uh, they might use it uh, to strike at Israel back. Uh, at the nuclear facilities, that these nuclear facilities are uh, uncovered, they know where they are, and they will not be shy of uh, hitting them, and perhaps also, you know, in the future using their nuclear power as well. You know, this is this what I call a serious escalation. This is something that the world should focus on right now uh, and use the time that we have. We don't know how much we have right now, because we know that Iran is just a couple of months away, you know, from the bomb. Uh, in order to stop this, stop, you know, from the further nuclearization of the Middle East, because the consequences can be uh, uh, unprecedented. And just in terms of brokering a deal between Israel and Hamas, Qatar is instrumental in that. Qatar is reassessing its role as a mediator. It says uh, that it's being exploited. It feels undermined. Are you confident that a two-state solution can come about? Well, I, I will just have to tell you a few words about Qatar. You know, I uh, uh, do know that, uh, you know, this mediation between Israel and Hamas elevates Qatari position in the world globally. They became basically the hub of diplomatic activity in the past few months. I do not believe very much, you know, that they will just give it away because uh, they heard a few harsh words uh, from uh, some of the U.S. congressmen or Israeli politicians. In fact, they heard them also before. They will continue. Now, the big question is whether they can provide a deal. Uh, and this is something that it puzzles many, especially in Israel, because we've heard time and again, Qatari officials saying, well, you know, it's over the corner. Uh, it's really close. Uh, we are getting there. And then nothing happens. We are still in square one. 
Uh, regarding the two-state solution, well, unfortunately, I can tell you, you know, and being a ex-member of the opposition, uh, I didn't think that Netanyahu was interested in this kind of solution before, 10 years ago when I was in the Knesset, but also today with this most far-right uh, coalition that uh, he has, or maybe they have more grip on him than he has over them. Uh, I don't think that this is the direction. Uh, yeah, I think that we are getting further away from the two-state solution, uh, unfortunately, because indeed this is the only solution that can bring some stabilization and peace and uh, security to both sides and, in fact, to the whole of the Middle East. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. That's Ksenia Svetlov, a former Israeli Member of Parliament. Let's take another look at some of this morning's front pages now. In the mail, Nicola Sturgeon's husband, Peter Murrell, has been charged over the alleged embezzlement of SNP funds. The Mirror has an exclusive interview with Mark Menzies' former aide, Katie Fieldhouse, who claims she warned the chief whip after the filed MP made a 3am call to her, requesting £5,000. And the Times leads with the Prime Minister's crackdown on sick note culture as GPs lose the right to sign patients off work. Well, sticking with that story now, as uh, there are warnings over medicalising the everyday challenges and worries of life. This is Rishi Sunak, who is giving a major speech on welfare reform later this morning. The Prime Minister will say the focus must shift to what work people might be able to do amid government concerns some are being unnecessarily written off as sick and parked on welfare. Well, James Hansen from Times Radio is still here with us, and we're joined also by another James, former Labour advisor James Schneider. If I can come to you first, James Hansen. Uh, ju just in terms of Rishi Sunak, political capital, the local elections, the general elections mm. that are coming, they obviously think that this is a vote winner, to say we need to get people off benefits, off sick, uh, off the sick culture. And, of course, after seven... You can self-certify for seven days, but after that you have to be signed off. Clearly, this is political expediency. Well, and there's a couple of things going on here. First of all, they have identified the fact that there are a huge number of people and a massive increase since the pandemic, a rise of 700,000 people long-term sick post-COVID, that if they can get some of those back to work, that improves productivity, that may help boost growth and boost the economy generally. So there's that side of things. There's also the fact that the welfare budget has absolutely ballooned over the past 10 years to the extent now that we're spending more on sickness benefits than we are on schools, for example. And so the government are thinking, well, look, if we need to raise money to spend in other areas or potentially to fund future tax cuts in a Tory manifesto, for example, for the election, where are we going to find that money? Mm. And it seems like they have identified the welfare bill as an area they can, they can raid. How might this work, James, in practice? Well, it won't work in practice at all. All it's doing is attacking the sick and vulnerable in society to cover up for 14 years of catastrophic failure. If you want to help people back into work, you help them into work. If you wish to deal with uh, the mental health stresses that people are facing, you provide mental health support. You don't stigmatise them and attack them. And we've been down this road before. We've seen what's happened with... Uh, hundreds, possibly thousands of people who have took their own lives after being passed fit for work by the DWP over the last few years. And if you do want to cut the welfare budget, you should look at the two biggest contributors to the welfare budget, which are subsidising private landlords through housing benefit and topping up low pay. If you really wanted to do something about it, you would boost minimum wage and you would cap rents. And if you wanted to raise money, if you needed to raise money, you would focus on the issue of tax dodging. You are 23 times more likely to be investigated for benefit fraud than for tax dodging, despite the fact that the uh, amount lost to the Treasury in benefit fraud is something in the order of one, one and a half billion a year. And the estimates for the amount lost in tax dodging start at 15 billion and go up as high as 100 billion, depending on who so, you listen So you to. don't think there is a problem then with people sitting at home not actually working when they should be in work? Because James's figures are right. When you look, we've lost 185 million working days lost to sickness or injury. The government, I agree, did lock people up in COVID. There is a culture of actually saying, I don't want to go out and work, equally young people disenfranchised because they can't buy a house. But you, you're saying there isn't a problem. I'm saying if you want to help people, if you want to genuinely help people, as opposed to stigmatise people and put, claim that there is this huge pot of money that people are stealing, then what you would do is provide mental health support and help people genuinely back into work. You would also boost pay and so on and so forth. If you were serious about the things they're claiming they're serious about, 
You don't go down this route, which we already know leads to vulnerable people taking their own lives when they are told that they are, they, they are fit for work. This is what, the, and the reason why this policy can be put forward by Rishi Sunak and Mel Stride and the clapping seals in much of the media will say, of course, this is very sensible, is because they've never spoken to somebody who has been through this type of uh, physical or mental stress, who is then passed but how do you for explain the, How do you explain these numbers, going from 1.9 million people up to 2.8 mm. uh, million people? Long so, COVID. So, so, pardon? Long COVID. Long COVID, which we believe doesn't really exist. Who's we? The medical profession are very clear about this. No, and all the not. latest studies show no, that not. actually the idea of having a long COVID syndrome mm. doesn't exist. But That's, just, no, just hold, let, on, hold, hold on, hold on. No, no, stop. Please cite one medical source, because that is absolute nonsense. You can't just we sit We spoke here. about it on you, the show you, at the weekend. You can't saying just that sit here and say things that are long COVID, patently it not is a, true. It is a portfolio of other illnesses. But let's just go back to... A portfolio a, of other illnesses which have been brought on by people having COVID. That, you can't, uh, that is a, let, just a James, pure nonsense. James, it's a pure nonsense. Just going back to the point, Rishi Sunak, and we were just mm. talking about the political expediency, he will hope this lands uh, and lands well. He will. He will absolutely. I mean, to be honest, you know, it's been another frustrating week for Rishi Sunak politically mm. because the government have had, as they would see it, some good economic news this week. Inflation fell again. Most people, though, aren't feeling the impact of that in their pocket. Prices are still rising, just not rising by as much. And actually, look at most of the stories dominating the headlines this week. We've got allegations over Mark Menzies, the Tory MP who's now had the whip suspended. We had Liz Truss's book come out at the start of the week reminding a lot of people of the chaos of Rishi Sunak's predecessor. So once again, the government try to move the narrative on, try to talk about what they want to talk about, better economic news, and now this big reform to welfare. And yet, they've got some difficult headlines. Oh, we've got local with. elections coming up. Mm -hmm. It's also an election year. And as you say, what are people thinking about? What are the headlines that stand out? It's not Rishi Sunak's speech later on today no. on sick note culture. It is this sense that... They are surrounded by sleaze. It's they've, one allegation yeah, after another. They've almost reached that point now where the public simply aren't listening mm. to what the government has to say. And what they do hear and what they do pick up on are these increasingly outrageous stories of individual MPs getting into trouble. And obviously Mark Menzies disputes the allegations that have been made against him, but they are very serious allegations. And again, it feeds into this narrative a bit like, you know, in the tail end of John Major's government when you had all these accusations and stories about sleaze. It fits into a wider narrative about an end-of-days government. But also, Mark Menzies, not just about the individual and the allegations made against him, uh, James, but what the Tories did about it when they were told, because it looks on the surface at this stage that an investigation didn't really start until it was reported in the Times newspaper. Yes, and it, it does seem like either they should, he was in a very difficult situation and he required help and the intervention of the police, or he was doing something that he really shouldn't have done that should also be investigated by the police. And the fact that they, it seems they sat on it, uh, again, shows that um, you know they're not good at partying. They're not good at running the country. They're not good at putting money in your pockets. They're not good at running the trains, and they're not good at party. But what management. about Angela Rayner? That that seems to be running still in the press. Although today, obviously, it's been it's been superseded by other things. But uh, you know, the Labour Party isn't free of sleaze. Uh, I don't think the Angela Rayner. I agree with you. The Labour Party is not free of sleaze. But the Angela Rayner thing has got nothing to do with sleaze whatsoever. The sleaze is... Uh, well, it's a trust issue, though, well, isn't the, this, it? The sleaze is the revolving door between Westminster and corporate lobbying. And Keir Starmer has reopened up the Labour Party to corporate lobbyists and to, uh, to corporate capture. That's what sleaze is. This story about Angela Rayner, which is being given such a huge push by the media and seems like basically pretty much a non-story, and that's why in a poll I saw yesterday, I think it was Savanta poll, a big chunk of the population, something like 40%, think it's a but, smear but, but it is operation. a story if she broke electoral law, isn't it? Uh, so, by broke electoral law, you mean was registered at the wrong address? Uh, I mean, by also just not declaring the amount of tax she should have paid well, and that's also not registering herself by electoral law, exactly right, by registering herself... Do you know what the statute of limitations is? I do, Do you know what the year? Right, OK. What, do you know what year that happened in? A long time have ago. You so ever, have, you, have, you, have you ever... Have you ever... All I'm asking is... Hold on, no, no, think... but all I'm asking you is, have you ever 
been registered at one address because you were living there, then you moved somewhere else, moved back, etc., etc. Well, it's, no. quite an it's quite an ordinary, uh, quite an ordinary thing. I don't know actually what the case is. I don't know that it's ordinary to have a teenage child that, living at an address that you're not. Now that I think now at. now that I think is is quite unpleasant um, because who knows and and frankly who has the right to know what uh, the family uh, relations were of people who at the time were not in the public eye, which concerned someone who was a child. I'm sorry, that is not, uh, that's not a public interest. I don't know, but... James, just very James, James, yeah. James, James well, well, I, I, I just think, James, you're making the mistake that Labour have made with this story from the start, which is to see it all as a smear. And because it came from, yes, a hostile biography from Lord Ashcroft and is being peddled by a lot of the right-wing press, to somehow dismiss the substance of this story. And that's a mistake. Had Labour... From the start, had Angela Rayner been more transparent, released this, so say, independent tax advice she had had, even had she made an error and had to pay some money back, people would have been understanding. But because they've been very defensive over this, they've made the situation worse. And she's now in a situation in which she's had to say that if she's found to have done anything wrong, she will resign. She's had to put mm. this as yeah. a really high-stakes thing. It didn't need to get to this point. Yeah. Both James is... We have to pause it there, I'm afraid. Thank uh, you James very Hansen friend. from Times Radio and former Labour advisor mm. James Schneider. Now, a Public Health Wales report has suggested that vape-addicted children should be offered nicotine patches to help wean them off. Health officials also urged a ban on disposable vapes, as well as names and flavours like bubblegum, or watermelon. Well, joining us now is public health consultant Chris Emerson. Chris, uh, you have been involved in this report. You wrote the report. Can you summarise the key findings for us? Well, the report brought together people from all across Wales. So it included people from education, people from the environmental health services, people from the NHS. So it was bringing everybody together to, to get a real understanding of what was going on and make some evidence-based recommendations. And there's two real streams of things that we're, we've recommended. One is about denormalizing vaping amongst young people. We talked to a lot of young people as part of this. We talked to a lot of people who work with young people in schools, in youth services, in places like that. And what they said very often was that they felt that vaping was becoming more normalised amongst younger people. And younger people often even overestimated uh, the, the amount of vaping that was going on. And they said that they felt that a lot of these products were, were really targeted towards them in terms of the flavours, in terms of the kind of bright packaging that people will see in shops. So we proposed that what we should see is um, applying some of the things that have been very effective in stopping young people taking up smoking to vapes. So that means things like plain packaging, taking them off the uh, display within shops, addressing some of the marketing that's going on. Um, and the other side of that was also to make sure that, that those young people who are finding they're having problems with nicotine dependency from vapes, which is just a proportion of those young people who are vaping. But it gives us increasing concern that we see people coming forward telling us that that vaping is disrupting their, their health, their well-being, their education. So what we wanted to, to make sure was that those people are getting the kind of support that they need because the kind of the... the you know, the market for vaping has changed an awful lot, and I'm sure people have been aware of that. A lot of new products have come onto the market. The patterns, the way people are using vapes are changing. So it's, it's a different world out there in many ways, and we want to make sure we can respond to that to give children who are vaping the support that they need to stop. I mean, Chris, I found this report really alarming uh, to read, not just the rapid rise in the number of children mm. at vaping, but the fact that there are children who are simply unable to get through a school day without vaping, they are dependent. What does that dependency look like? Well, this is just a proportion of those who are vaping. And we often find that when we talk to young people about why they're vaping, obviously there's there's many that will try in a kind of experimental way, but there's also those who will say that they, are, they feel that they're using it to manage things like stress, and they are also finding then, of course, that they are dependent on it. So what we tend to find with those who are really developing that dependency is they often have lots of other things going on in their lives as well, and that's why one of the things we really want to see is that schools see this as, as a support issue and not a disciplinary issue. Um, we find a proportion of those who are vaping are also smoking, so there's more than one thing going on. Um, but yes, for some of those, really, we're, we're hearing that that's being very disruptive. So children will find it very difficult to get through those lessons. We talk to school management teams. They're talking about how it can affect the whole of the school. So they're talking about having to patrol toilets to stop children vaping. We're talking about, you know, toilets getting blocked up with disposable devices. So there's ways in which it's affecting the school as a whole, as well as just those individual children within it. And just let's talk about some of the physical symptoms. What are you seeing in these children? What, what, what are they displaying? 
So um, there's cravings that, that one would get from any kind of nicotine dependency. We hear people talking about um, uh, anxiety. We hear people talking about sleeplessness, um, a lack of concentration in school, um, and just not being able to really manage that addiction very easily. So it's, you know, they're really having problems, particularly in class, and that's where we're seeing most of it. But they're also having problems outside school. So it's affecting their relationships. Obviously, it's been illegal to sell a vape to uh, anybody under 18 for six or seven years. So you've also got people accessing these things illegally. So that's also creating stresses for people. So it's, it's creating issues for young people across a whole range of things. And just briefly, Chris, just talk me through the proposals or the suggestion that children should be given nicotine patches. Well, anybody who is over 12 and smokes um, can get nicotine replacement products, so things like patches and gums, through In Wales Help Me Quit, which is our national cessation service. So that's available to, to those who smoke. Now, historically, we haven't tended to give those kind of products to people who vape because vaping devices haven't been as good at delivering nicotine as tobacco and cigarettes have been, and therefore the, the dependency level tends to be less. But as I said, we see these new products coming on board, and we see these um, the effects that this is having, and we feel we need to really start exploring whether for a proportion of those young people who are vaping who are really showing those signs of dependency we should make those things available to them as well so that's what we're exploring at the minute in wales uh, chris emerson public health consultant good to hear from you thanks very much indeed for joining us still to come on talk today new figures show almost four million people are visiting private dentists and omg and lol if you use either of these phrases you are officially old and uncool. I'm both of those things. <laughs> Broadcaster Nikki Hodgson and former political advisor Leon Emirali take us through this morning's papers. That's next. This is Talk Today. The time is 8.27. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. The home of big opinions. Oh, don't start me on that. Straight talking. There's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. And no nonsense. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Is going digital. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Make sure you're ready. But the government has got to be more flexible. From the end of April, listen to talk on radio via DAB or your smart speaker. Or watch live on YouTube on your connected TV. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 8.30. We'll have the weather for you in just a moment. But here's what else is coming up in the programme. Outing her exes, Taylor Swift has a new album out, which has got everyone talking. <laughs> we'll be discussing that in the papers next. Attempting a record before nine, we'll meet the 19-year-old who's attempting to become the youngest person ever with Down syndrome to complete the London Marathon this weekend. And a royal return. Prince William is back at work after his wife's cancer diagnosis. We'll discuss that a little later at 9.20. But first of all, most importantly, Joe, what's the weather like? Well, especially since it's the marathon this weekend, I've missed that bit. Uh, should be quite good conditions for running, actually. Uh, mostly dry, bit of sunshine around, but not too warm. And that's pretty much the kind of conditions we're looking at as high pressure starts to build to the west. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Yes, a bit of a change on the way as high pressure starts to build, and that is going to settle things down. Doesn't necessarily mean to say the weather's going to be perfect, but certainly better in some brighter skies. And that high pressure is out to the west. It hovers around over the weekend. At times, it'll be in places where it will allow some cloud and patchy rain, and we'll take a look at that. And then as we go into next week, you can see that high pressure still vaguely there or thereabouts. So we are looking at some quieter conditions overall. Now, we've seen some rain going south overnight. That's uh, still got to make its way away. So quite a lot of cloud around, some outbreaks of rain, but then the sky is clearing from the north. Now, of course, there will be some fair weather cloud, but we're still looking at temperatures around 12 or 13 degrees Celsius. And then as we come into England and Wales, yes, there'll be some showers. These mostly through central areas and out towards the east. So probably western parts seeing the best of the sunshine, although there will be a little bit of rain over the Republic of Ireland too. Now, temperatures at best probably reaching around 14 degrees Celsius, might squeeze a 15 out in those western areas, which will feel quite pleasant as the winds become lighter. But on the east coast, those winds aren't lighter. It's quite a brisk northerly, so it is going to feel pretty chilly there. And certainly through the day, temperatures are only single figures. Now, overnight, with clearing skies, we're likely to see temperatures low enough for a touch of grass frost in places, maybe even one or two pockets of air frost too, so gardeners beware. Uh, and those are the values in the towns and cities, obviously cooler still in rural areas. And then through the course of Saturday, we see that cloud still coming across those North Sea coasts, working its way inland, and some thicker cloud for parts of Scotland. And with that, we'll see some showery rain as well. But it's not too cold there. Temperatures 9 to 12 degrees Celsius. As we come further south, we're looking at a much drier picture. There will be some brightness around, but also areas of cloud at times. And temperatures very similar to today, 14 or 15 degrees Celsius. Uh, those winds on the east coast will lighten up a little bit, ease, but uh, it will still be quite breezy there as well. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Joe's last day with us uh, today. Very so sad, can we it? say to Joe, thank you for bringing the sunshine into the <laughs> oh, studio, very well done. regardless of what craziness has been going yeah, on absolutely. outside the weather? Time now to go through today's papers with broadcaster Nikki Hodgson and former political advisor Leon Emerali. Um, Nikki, uh, to the front of the... Uh, sorry, page five of The Telegraph, and this is a story about the number of people taking up private dentistry. Yeah, I mean, record... And I don't mean do it yourself. No. I mean, pay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we call that home dentistry, clear. actually, as yeah. opposed yeah. to private dentistry. But, yeah, this is this, this is some new figures out that show uh, 3.8 million people are now covered by some dental plan. Um, that's up from 3.2 million uh, in 2019. Obviously, the pandemic has had a, this massive impact on NHS dentistry. You simply can't get an appointment. Mm. Uh, I... Obviously, I have a little girl. I had a baby uh, 14 months ago. You get a certificate to have free dental treatment when you have a child because your teeth get so messed around by having the child. And um, I couldn't use it for a year because I couldn't get an appointment 
Yeah. You know, all the, the, the dentists at the practice where I was registered kept quitting uh, because one of the problems we've got now is there just aren't enough dentists. There, even in private practices, mm -hmm. actually, there aren't enough dentists. Um, we are in a real crisis with dentistry. And, and, and so, the figures yeah. are absolutely astounding. 52,000 patients went to A&E with a tooth abscess. Mm -hmm. This was a last year. We also know 25% of kids under five have yeah. rotting teeth. This needs to be addressed and very quickly by government, doesn't it? It does. And it feeds into this wider narrative that public services in the country just simply don't work. They aren't fit for purpose. And I think when it comes to things like dentistry, when you're in real pain, which, you know, having a toothache or having an issue with your teeth, it is horrible. Yeah. Um, and if you're not able to see a dentist because you, you, the waiting list are too long or you just can't get in, it's absurd. And I saw a couple of weeks ago, a month or so ago, there was a queue mm -hmm. yep. outside for a new and, practice, a, new yes. practice yeah. opening up, a yep. queue along the street. And it was unbelievable that this was for a dentist. I thought it was for like a concert or something. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's the state of the country mm -hmm. at the moment. Well, there's we a, do I think mean, they're saying in this report that actually in February in Bristol, a new practice opened and police had to intervene and send people yeah. home because they yeah. were so desperate to get on the books of this new NHS dentist. Uh, I don't know what the answer is, actually. Actually, I really don't. It's not more money, actually. It's not more money. No, no, case. and uh, the it's figures. More dentists. Well, the figures. It, that is exactly the yeah. point. Ninety percent. We've been a joke for a long time around the world. So yeah. the state yeah. of our teeth. Uh, yeah. Somebody who might need a dentist. The statue of the Virgin Mary <laughs> in uh, <laughs> Germany. Is yes. it? Um, Red blood, mysterious drops of red blood dripping from her head. I love this story. So, so yeah, people have saw the, 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 the statue um, and they've seen blood. They're thinking it's a miracle. How on earth is this statue dripping blood? It turns out it wasn't necessarily a miracle. It may well have just been red mites that, oh. were, that were coming through the stone uh, and looking like the appearance of blood. But um, no, I love this. I mean, imagine imagine walking through, seeing this statue, and see, you see something that you think is blood. Spider-like mites, apparently. <laughs> but it's spider-like mites, which isn't quite as, uh, as miraculous as some might have thought. Uh, but it just tells you, doesn't it, that uh, don't always believe what you see. It's never, there's, <laughs> ne there's no such thing as miracles in this day and age. Indeed. I like this quote. The Catholic Church purposely exercises particular caution when assessing seemingly miraculous <laughs> phenomena. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's move to the sun, uh, shall we? Taylor Swift's revenge. Great <laughs> story, Nikki. It's quite a good story. I mean, she's got this new album out. And uh, apparently she's uh, she's gone in on her ex-lover, who was the British guy, Joe Alwyn, who apparently cheated on her. She, there are strong hints in the lyrics of the songs that that he cheated. Great way apparently, of <laughs> yeah. Apparently, <laughs> some of the lyrics are, "You deserve prison, but you won't get time. You'll slide slide into inboxes and slip through the bars." So it's pretty damning. Mm. It's incredibly um, damning. Yes. Yeah. And a surprise this morning, Leon, because a 2 a.m. surprise. It's actually not one album, it's two. It's two. I've already downloaded it. I'm going to Have be listening you? to it on my way home from here. Um, so I'm looking forward to that, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, I mean, I'm not There are perks to getting up so early <laughs> there to are be indeed. on the yeah. show. There are indeed. I just don't guess it. She's completely passed me by as a really? phenomenon. And I'm, I would I'm, agree with that. I'm really, really into female singer-songwriters. So I, I don't know what it is about me and Taylor Swift that don't get on. But I would say, as a writer myself, if somebody dumps you or treats you terribly, you definitely write about them later and I've yeah. done that so many times. The problem for Taylor is, is she, I mean, she's obviously you know an incredibly uh, attractive woman but would you be slightly perturbed if you were to go out with her because you know you're going to be in well, one of her songs you know you're going to get slandered at any given point yeah so, that's uh, been my problem but she yeah. transcends yes. music doesn't she I mean there's very swift anomics and the impact that she can mm. have she is a tour de force she has and huge, this album she has huge different. influence I just would like to see her come out in favour of somebody in the American election because that'd be quite handy well I think yeah. Yeah, I mean she <laughs> I think that's part of her problem actually is that if she does come out what one way or the other she'll then alienate quite a big yeah. uh, big pot chunk of the American population because don't forget her roots are in country music yeah, quite sure. sort of Republican right yeah. wing and I get the feeling about that she likes to be liked some people don't care about that, but I think this is a, this is a pleaser here, somebody who wants people to like and love her. Yeah. Um, and that's very difficult. Leon, I hope you've got a long journey home, by the way, because <laughs> it's over two hours is it really? long. It's 31 songs. <laughs> oh, I might have to extend my journey. I might have to extend my journey. Round, round, round. traffic. Should we move on, Leon, to uh, what we were trailing earlier? Brits who use OMG and WTF, <laughs> which we think we are really cool doing. Yeah. Do you honestly? Uh, We've no. just had a very funny <laughs> conversation about it. No, I honestly don't. Apparently not cool. 
No, not cool at all, actually, um, which is quite a surprise because I'm using nearly all of these words <laughs> yes, that they, exactly. they, uh, yeah, that they say. But no, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I grew up. Page on eight the, of the start. Page eight of the start. I grew up on on MSN Messenger uh, back in the day. <laughs> You're yeah. not yeah. old enough. And I and I I loved <laughs> using MSN Messenger. Where all this sort of stuff was was just you know the the, the coolest thing you could do. It has not been updated, has it? And I use the old school emojis, the crying faces, yeah. when apparently you're meant to be using skull and crossbones. We, yeah, we were talking about this. I I use my own emojis, and some people don't understand them. My friends do. So I use three cherries in a row, and something's fabulous. You know, like a slot machine. Hurrah! Right. And um, there's also a warthog that looks like a pig with a monocle, much more like that. Where do you so find these? They're all in. They're all on oh, iPhone. They are, they? So I use that when I'm inquiring for further information about something. So yeah, oh. I try and be creative with emojis. I'm so like my, own, yeah, my own little system. Yeah. Here are the top ten. YOLO. No, you don't only ever use once. that. That's very American. LMAO. <laughs> <laughs> laugh my mm, off. Don't use that. Uh, LOL, we know, laugh yeah. out loud. ROFL, roll on floor laughing. No. Oh, FOMO, we know. Funny. FOMO, I know. Yeah, fear yeah. of missing out. OMG. OMG. Yes, we know that. Yes. TGIF. That's quite American, isn't it? <laughs> That's very American. Yeah, well, we know TGIF, but this one as well, G2G. Gotta go. Gotta, Gotta go. go. That, that, yeah, got to go. But no, it, I use BRB. BRB is good. Be right back. <laughs> but, but, you know, I think you can tell a lot about a person. If you look on your phone, your most frequently used emojis. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. If, whatever they are, you can tell I'm a lot about a person. Mine is the monkey doing is it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that tells you a lot. Anyway, G2G. <laughs> Gotta go. G2G. Uh, Nikki Hodgson, Leon Emerali, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Take you through the papers this morning. Well, looking ahead to this weekend, and a 19-year-old is set to break a record at this year's London Marathon. Lloyd Martin from Surrey was born with Down syndrome and a hole in the heart. But despite doctors' predictions, Lloyd, along with his mother Kerry, will be running the race this Sunday in a bid to make marathon history and to prove he can do it because, well, he wants to. Well, both Lloyd and his mother Kerry are joining us now. Lloyd... Uh, a very exciting moment for you. How do you feel ahead of the marathon, which is this Sunday? It feels confident. And I want to achieve my goal and anything is possible. Those are brilliant words. I absolutely agree. Anything is possible. Kerry, you've obviously encouraged him. Also, I believe running runs in the family, quite literally. Uh, yes, um, yes. Well, my, my dad uh, has done five London marathons. Um, I've done four, so this will be my fifth. Um, and that the whole family run, you know, we're all uh, all park runners, and and that's where this this started off um, doing park runs. And Lloyd found his love for running. Um, uh, but I didn't think a park run would then end up at the marathon because it's a, a fair different uh, distance. It certainly is. Lloyd, what has the training been like for you? Uh, um, good. Um, very, very good. Um, confident and I just keep <laughs> go with it. And if you wanted to... I mean, do you reckon you could beat your mum? <laughs> <laughs> He'll always beat me in a sprint finish. I, I'm sure he will. Over the line, so, so, just in terms of this, Kerry, the, the title he is hoping to achieve is the youngest person to compete um, complete a marathon. Uh, there is a category for this, but, did you know, just in terms of that, I, I, I'm going to show off here, I have run a marathon. It's incredibly hard. It's not the same as running, say, two lots of ten miles, is it? Or t two lots of ten miles plus six. No, it, it is um, it is incredibly hard. Uh, it, it, it's all the um, hours of training that you have to put in. Uh, you have to make sure you're wearing the right kit. Um, you've got the right nutrition on board. Um, and, and that's not just during training, but actually on the day. There's so many things that can go wrong, even if you put in all the hard work. So, um, you know, if, if it rains, then... Uh, everything can be a nightmare you can get blisters you you know you can be too cold that you can't even access your food and drink so um looking at your weather report it looks uh, looks nice and dry hopefully yes. and, and Kerry looking back 19 years when Lloyd was born and you were told that he had down syndrome had a hole in the heart I'm sure you could never have imagined this day how does it feel for you oh it, it's it's amazing um it, it is 
it's just wonderful that he's even running at all, never mind uh, attempting a marathon. Well, I think it's absolutely extraordinary. Uh, Kerry, are you trying to raise money for anyone or raising awareness or raising awareness of Down syndrome? Oh, d definitely raising awareness um, amongst the, you know, the whole disability um, community. Um, but we're also running for Special Olympics GB and for our local uh, Down syndrome uh, stepping stones. Um, and uh, yeah, just be grateful if anybody um, could donate at all because it's been so helpful um, mm. for Lloyd. Both organisations um, uh, have helped him and encourage him to play sports because there's so many clubs out there, sporting clubs that aren't open to those with disabilities. Uh, so it's just fantastic that Lloyd can get out there and get involved and see um, what is what is achievable. Absolutely. Uh, how can people, if people are watching and want to support you, Lloyd and Kerry, how can they? Um, our, uh, it's a Just Giving site. Uh, it's Lloyd Martin's London Marathon, Just Giving. Brilliant. And Lloyd, you are a true champion. We're all wishing you the best of luck uh, for Sunday. Thank you so We're much. We're in awe. We really, we really are in awe. Lloyd and Kerry, thank you so much for joining us this morning. As we said, very good luck uh, this weekend as well. What an inspiring young man. I'm going to be there. I'm going to try and go and watch. So, Lloyd, I will be looking out for you and your mum and cheering you on. Yeah, well done you. Well done him as well. Right, still to come, official figures suggest there are 1,300 retail thefts every single day with opportunists exploiting self-service checkouts. So the question is, is it time to ditch the touchscreen tills? We're debating that next. This is Talk Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 8.50. Now, a Sainsbury's worker has been sacked by the retailer after stealing bags for life whilst paying for his shopping at a self-service checkout. After being told by bosses that he could no longer be trusted, the worker claimed he was tired and unaware of what he was doing. But with the continued risk of thefts, constant customer confusion and high upfront costs, is it time to scrap self-service checkouts? <laughs> well, joining us now is broadcaster Rebecca Jane, who thinks that to get rid of self-service provisions would be a great shame because they're so efficient. Meanwhile, former retail assistant Sally McCormick believes that the devices are unbelievably unresponsive and they need to go. Rebecca Jane, everyone hates self-service <laughs> checkouts, don't they? Not me. I love firm dairies. I, I absolutely... I don't really like to shop at any supermarket that doesn't have a self-service option. No offence to anybody, but I spend all day talking for my job. <laughs> I don't want to be talking to somebody when I'm buying my ch chicken at the end of the day. But what about when the, sh the thing says unidentified item in bagging area, seek assistance, which I get every day? Yeah, I know, me too. Absolutely infuriating, isn't it? With the technology that we have today, I don't understand why there's not a better system that they can do. The self-service bit is not the problem, it's the technology. And actually, if they got to grips with that, I think that more people would embrace and actually love them. Uh, Sally, uh, you've worked in uh, retail. Um, I presume you're concerned about this because effectively it takes away the need for people, for human beings, doesn't it? Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Because the job market at the minute is extremely competitive anyway. People are struggling to find work. I myself was looking for work um, recently and there are absolutely the reduce in jobs in retail is absolutely shocking at the minute. And, and just coming back to you, Rebecca Jane, we talked about those self-service tills where you put your stuff in there and it measures, you, you know, the weight and whether it goes in your bag. There are other stores, aren't there? And I have to say, I was mind-blown when I went to one of these stores and you put all your stuff together. It knows what you've got. And so, going back to your point, it's all about technology. Yeah, I am a, I am a self-service, self-confessed, absolute geek. So there is one particular retailer that has horrific problems with queues. And actually, all you do is you put your stuff on the shelf, it knows, you pay, you leave. I don't understand if this is already available, why actually grocery shops yeah. can't do it as well. You know, the technology is there and we need to embrace and use it. That being said, I don't think we should completely do away with manned checkouts because I think they're a vital resource for a lot of people. But I think we do need to stop demonising them and start embracing them as the way of the future. Uh, I think you're talking about Zara, aren't you? And I think Decathlon is another store that has the same. And it is brilliant. It you is just brilliant. put your things in. The problem <laughs> is the majority of us, when we go to the supermarket and we're trying to scan our items and they won't scan and we're standing there for ages and at the end of the day, you've, they've been, you've been there longer than you would have done if you'd queued at the man checkout. But the problem, Sally, is the queues at the man checkouts, isn't it? You get behind someone with a full trolley when you want to buy three items. Yes, absolutely. I've, I've shopped in Zara a lot myself and I find older people tend to grab, like, gravitate towards the self-checkout and they have absolutely no idea how to use the technology. So it just means that it's holding up an entire queue of people behind them waiting to use the self-checkout. And a lot of the time, if there's no one man in that area, like a member of staff, they have to then go to the operated tills and get someone to help them from there, which is slowing down two channels of get, you know, getting everyone shopping through. But so that is the reason why I absolutely detest the Zara ones in particular. Oh, do you? So that's interesting. But Sally, isn't the, isn't the problem here also is not only are you shopping, you also have to act as the shop assistant. You have to fold everything, put it in the bag. And actually what we're doing <laughs> is... Remove the tags. Is, <laughs> remove the tags. I had to remove the tags and all that stuff. But you're basically undoing people's jobs. This goes back to a much bigger problem. And particularly you mentioned elderly people there. I think older people want to have a chat while, whilst they're shopping. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be met with technology definitely i would agree like from my own experience i have worked in a number of major retailers and we've never offered self-service checkouts because we understand that consumers need that like conversation i will say as well i know rebecca you said that you work in a job where you're talking all day i also I'm, like obviously i'm in retail so i'm talking to people every day but i do notice that because i've been in that position when i'm serving someone within the first like two seconds i can tell whether they want me 
to chat to them or whether they just want to get through the service like quickly, easily without any like sort of conversation. But I think being able to offer that for people, whether they want it or not, is extremely important. And sorry, I was just going to say, Rebecca Jane, isn't isn't there a worry that actually one of the biggest problems in society is we don't talk enough to each other, we don't understand enough about each other, and this just extrapolates and makes that problem worse? I think you've got a point, but the conversations that we need to be having and the reasons why we don't talk to each other enough are not you know, they're not placed at the checkout. They are actually with our families and with our friends. You know, we're not going to get deep and meaningful with somebody who's checking out what we're going to be having for dinner. So you do have a point, and I do think that isolation is a serious issue in today's society. But I don't think that this is where we should be looking to support it. That being said, again, I do say that, you know, sort of elderly people are very isolated, and I think that they really do appreciate that personal service. That's why I think it needs to be an option. But realistically, David, you know, what is people's issue with using <laughs> self-checkouts? It is purely the technology. Mm. If it was great, I think that everybody would be doing it. You've got, to get, help when you, you've got to get help when you buy alcohol, when you buy a bottle you of wine, have, though, don't you? Anyway, <laughs> uh, Rebecca Jane and Sally McCormick, thank you very much indeed. Uh, still to come, the Prime Minister is to announce a welfare clampdown later today and he's expected to take aim at sick note. Britain will hear what you have to say on the matter next. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV.
This is Talk Today with David Ball and Sarah Hewson. Good morning to you. It is 9 o'clock on Friday the 19th of April. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and, of course, on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. Middle East escalation. Breaking news this morning with reports Israel has been targeting Iran. Downing Street says Israel has the right to defend itself after last weekend's attack. Sick note Britain. The Prime Minister is calling for an end to sick note culture in a major speech on welfare reform. And Prince William returns to work for the first time after the Princess of Wales announced her cancer diagnosis. And it's all looking a bit brighter for the weekend. Not terribly warm, but we should see some sunshine at some point. All the details coming up. Thanks very much indeed, Joe. But now it's time for your headlines with Mirabla. Good morning. U.S. officials say Iran has been hit by an Israeli missile. Flights have been suspended over several cities, and Iran's state-run news agency says air defense batteries have been fired in several provinces. But Iran's Tasnin news agency has posted these pictures of Isfahan's nuclear facility, saying the city is safe and sound. Iran has been on high alert after Israel said it would respond to Iranian missiles and drones fired at Israel last Saturday night. But Middle East analyst Jonathan Lord says Iran is trying to to minimize the impact of the attack. Iranian state media uh, has uh, seemed to downplay uh, the attack, uh, saying that uh, a number of small drones have been intercepted by Iranian air defense over Isfahan. Uh, that seems to indicate that Iran is seeking to step down off the ledge, minimize uh, the uh, impact of the attack, uh, and perhaps walk back down the escal escalation ladder from here. The husband of former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has been charged in connection with the embezzlement of funds from the Scottish National Party. Peter Morrill was taken into custody yesterday and was questioned by Police Scotland detectives. He was previously arrested as a suspect in April last year before being released without charge. Rishi Sunak is to call for an end to the sick note culture as he warns against over-medicalising the everyday challenges and worries of life. In a major speech on welfare reform, the Prime Minister wants to shift the focus to what people can do with the right support in place rather than what they can't do. He also wants sick notes issued by specialist work and health professionals rather than GPs to reduce workloads. And here's something cute to cheer you up. This is a six-week-old baby rhinoceros enjoying his first steps into the outside world. He now weighs 100 kilos and seems happy enough running around his paddock for the first time at Whipsnade Zoo. Kilo baby. <laughs> yes, absolutely enormous. Sorry, you haven't finished. No, indeed, you're yeah. up to date. We'll oh, have more at 10. Fantastic stuff. Yes, very, very cute indeed. We're asking this morning about the general election. When should it be? Should Rishi Sunak call it now after the local elections or should he actually wait? So many, so many messages coming in on this. Alistair says, even though I don't want a Labour government led by Sir Flip Flop, this Conservative lot is completely useless too. So I might as well get it over and done with. Whoever wins, we're all going to suffer. Uh, we're also asking whether sh GPs should lose the right to sign patients off work. We're going to have a speech from the Prime Minister uh, later on today, uh, vowing to crack down on sick note uh, Britain. Uh, Charlie says, if a doctor can't certify you medically fit or unfit for work, then who can? And Angus says, good morning, David and Sarah, good morning to you. Uh, the number of people on benefits presents a sizable part of our society. The larger this group grows, the harder it is to change the system. And George says, honestly, I don't blame the people on benefits. Most of us who work know that our hard work doesn't pay our bills. What it does pay for is this government's waste. Let's get more now on the breaking news this morning from the Middle East, where early reports suggest Israel may have carried out an operation in Iran following the drone and missile attack at the weekend. So far, Israel has not released an official statement claiming responsibility, but Downing Street says it does have the right to defend itself. Iranian state media, though, is downplaying the seriousness, saying three drones were intercepted by its air defence systems over the province of Isfahan. Earlier, we spoke to former Israeli MP Ksenia Svetlova, who told us there was no sense of alarm in Israel. There is this sense of satisfaction that in the Israeli political class. Uh, it seems that Netanyahu achieved what he wanted. He showed that he can retaliate. 
uh, and he's not binded by uh, all of these pleads by his regional and international allies. But at the same time, he didn't want this uh, all-out war in the Middle East. It seems to be, from what we see from the Iranian uh, response, it's not about to happen, at least not now. Uh, there is no special alert in Israel. There is no emergency state uh, in Israel. People are just, you know, continuing with the Friday. It's a free day. Uh, cafes are full. People are outside. There is no sense of something dramatic happening. There are already a few responses by the most far-right ministers in Israel's cabinet uh, that they describe this uh, response as mute, not enough, uh, something that uh, will not satisfy the, me the need to really retaliate. These are the voices of the ministers, Ben Gvir and Smutrich, who were calling for a very harsh blow on Iran, even at the cost of starting a uh, regional war. Uh, it seems that the, the voices of the uh, most moderate parts of this coalition, meaning Minister of Defense, Benny G Mr. Minister of Defense, Yoav Gallant, and also Minister Benny Gantz, uh, who supported some kind of uh, response, but I think that uh, given their good relations for both of them with the United States and other allies of Israel, uh, their voice, uh, you know, that was the decisive voice uh, in forming and shaping uh, this kind of uh, response to uh, the very outstanding uh, Iranian attack about a week ago on uh, Israeli cities. Well, we also spoke to the former head of the British Army, Lord Richard Dannett, who told us the retaliation didn't come as a surprise. I suppose it's not a great surprise that notwithstanding the calls for restraint that um, have been echoing around and being delivered by international statesmen visiting Israel over the last few days, that uh, Israel has decided to retaliate in some shape or form following the attacks of uh, Saturday uh, Sunday uh, last weekend. Um, of course, we, we don't know. Um, we're all following the news media at the present moment to see what is actually being reported. But what it would seem is that uh, Israel uh, has retaliated, but in a fairly modest and moderate way. Um, of course, that's an initial assessment. We may find that there are successive waves of drones uh, and missiles coming in. But um, if, as it, as it would seem, that they are retaliating in principle, with a small number of missiles. It's probably uh, Netanyahu making the point that um, no one's gonna tell him what to do. And if he chooses to retaliate, he will. But um, he may well have listened to the messages of restraint uh, and therefore be retaliating in a modest way, but just to make the point that no one messes with Israel. I think, I think we'd all recognize um, in whatever conflict it is that if you strike another country's nuclear capability, then you really are stepping things up. So I would be surprised and very disappointed and very worried if it turned out that they had attacked a nuclear facility. But I'm, as I said a moment or two ago, I'm less surprised that notwithstanding the calls of restraint that uh, Israel has retaliated, I think to make the point that um, it, 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 it intended to, uh, and it has, but um, if it turns out that their attacks are moderate, then it may be part of drawing a line uh, under this um, chapter of um, tit-for-tat strikes, which started on the 1st of April in Damascus, then last weekend, uh, and, and now something else. Well, to Westminster now, and the Prime Minister will call for an end to sick note culture and warn against over-medicalising the everyday challenges and worries of life in a major speech on welfare reform later this morning. Rishi Sunak will say the focus must shift to what work people might be able to do amid government concerns. Some are being unnecessarily written off as sick and parked on welfare. Well, Ryan Saby is Deputy Political Editor of The Sun. Thank you very much indeed uh, for coming in. Rishi Sunak trying to seize the agenda here, front page of the Daily Telegraph, PM vows to end sick note culture. He makes a really good point, actually. The number of people who've been left on, on sick notes or fit notes, as they're now called, he points to how much money is being spent on this, and he hopes this will land and land well. Yeah, I think so. It's one of these key subjects where he thinks he has the, the, the initiative maybe over Labour when it comes to the overhaul on, on benefits. And one thing he's very keen on is to reduce the number of people who are on, on, the, on those fit notes. There was 11 million issued last year. He wants to uh, reduce that and actually get more people back into work. One of the key things is actually if people are concerned about their, their health and 
um, maybe there'll be some things that health specialists can actually do um, so they actually can continue work. There may be some little things around the edges that can actually get the people back working again. But that's again. what we'll be looking out for mm. today, isn't it? The detail of this. Who are these specialists? What are their qualifications? How is it going to work if a GP disagrees with their prognosis, for example? Yeah, that, that's one of the, the big questions, and we'll be pushing Rishi Sunak on that uh, when, when he makes that speech this morning. So one of the things is they want to shift away from GPs actually handing out these fit notes and move to these health specialists and other people. But one of the questions, who's going to fund it, where do they come from, what are their qualifications, that's going to, that's going to be a key thing. What you thing. don't want is a 111 service, really, mm. do you, where, you know, you've got someone going through a... A checklist. A checklist. And you make a great point. Who's funding it? We're already spending £176 billion on the NHS as it is. I think GPs will welcome this because, yeah. of course, everything is always dumped on the GP, it seems. Yeah, that's right. They've been massively... Over they're overstretched anyway. You speak to, you know, any, any GP anecdotally and they are... They've, they've, they've got far too much work. They, they, you know, sometimes they can't see all, all their patients and just look after the pandemic mm. as well. They are, they, are, they are really struggling. And then on, the, on top of that, you've got those NHS waiting lists um, and it's all just clogging up. It's a little bit too much for the mm. NHS. So if they can take some of the welfare and benefits angle up out of the system, um, it, ho hopefully you'll get more people back mm. into work, be massive for growth and economic productivity. Uh, you know, it is the front page of The Telegraph, but it's not really going to do very much to distract from the less palatable headlines for the Tories at the moment, particularly this week with the latest allegations against Mark Menzies. That's right. It's one thing after another for, for the Conservatives. We've had the, the Mark Menzies incident uh, where he claimed that bad people were after him wanted uh, large sums of money from, uh, from political aides. You just had last week, you had Will Ragg, who also uh, relinquished the, uh, the whip after the, the sort of Westminster honey, honey, honey trap plot. Um, so there just seems to be one thing after another. There are, there are absolutely, you know, I think the, the number of independent MPs is now, is now bigger than the Liberal Democrats. Democrats. So it's a real, real problem, not only just for the Conservative Party, but for politics in general. And of course, he resigned the whip, which means uh, they've got, what, 51 majority. There's this big poll as well. Rishi Sunak desperately hoping to cling on. We, as I said, we have the local elections coming up in two weeks' time. And the Ipsos Mori poll for the Evening Standard just is, puts the Tories in a, a sort of a state of decimation, really. 19%, the lowest since 1978. Yeah, it, it's, it's really bad for them. Uh, uh, how, how do you turn that around if, if that, is, that is replicated? I think one of the telling things will be um, when you come to the local elections in just a couple of weeks' time, you have the local mayoral elections in the West Midlands and the Tees Valley. Now, if they do lose a couple of one of those or both of them, I think it's really uh, an, uh, it's really terrible for the Conservatives. And you can almost say all bets are off when it comes so, to the so Commons and the MPs. what would happen if they lost one or two? Uh, I, I think it'd be it'd be bad. You just wonder if those those no confidence letters go in because I think it's all bets are off at that stage. Mm. Uh, that Ipsos Mori poll we were talking about also makes pretty grim reading for Keir Starmer on a personal basis in terms of <laughs> his ratings. Yes, yeah, so his ratings down to some minus fifty or, or so. Um, I think I think the trouble for both party leaders it's it's the public seem to have fallen out of love with the Conservatives, but they're not totally in love with Labour. And I think there's this gap in the middle of where lots of people are are sort of politically lost, and you wonder where more parties on, you know, uh, talk about reform or, or the Green Party, do people splinter off to those parties? Uh, and that poll sh actually reiterates what you've exactly said, which is about half of them know how they're going to vote, but 47% mm. are really rather lost in terms of how they will vote come an election. Can yeah. I bring in a message we've had from one of our viewers, Jerome, who says, I don't care about the timing of the election. I hope neither main party gets enough votes to make a significant difference. I really don't know what to think. I've totally lost my faith in politicians whatsoever. And we're hearing that over and over again. Yeah, right? this is this is the trouble. You've got a, a large you know, swell of people who are politically homeless, and they have mm. been for a long time. Whether they've been disillusioned by the Brexit referendum or conservative, the Conservatives being in power for 14 years, um, they, they need to find somewhere to go. And at the moment, they haven't got anywhere to go. And, and of course, the SNP also has problems of its own. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, Peter Marl. Sturgeon's uh, hu husband has been uh, has been charged. Um, that will overshadow the elections this year in Scotland as well. So that's that, that's difficult for them. And we wait to see what um, their leader Hamza Youssef says today. Mm -hmm. Ryan, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us with a whistle-stop tour through all of the latest <laughs> yes, political the headlines uh, this morning. And none of it makes particularly good <laughs> reading, does it? Uh, still to come, yeah. all the latest royal news, including what happened yesterday when Prince William made his first public engagement since his wife Kate's cancer diagnosis. The time is 9.14. Do stay with us.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 9.18. Now, Prince William has been spotted on his first royal engagement since the Princess of Wales' shock cancer diagnosis was revealed. The prince visited a surplus food redistribution charity in Surrey where he reassured royal fans that he's taking good care of Kate after he accepted Get Well Soon cards for both his wife and his father, the King. Well, joining us for more on this is Mel on Sunday's Charlotte Griffiths. Charlotte... Is it, what can we infer from this? Because obviously Prince William was told to look after his wife, which I thought was rather sweet, yes. actually. Um, but he's out and about. He's out and about. That's got to be a sign that Kate is not, you know, at her lowest, lowest ever. You know, so that's kind of a hopeful thing. Um, it's just a sign also that their Easter holidays have ended and they're just back in London, back to work. But I don't think we're going to see a lot of William. I just think it's going to be very sparing. You know, he's going to be very sparing with how much he goes out and about. I think one or two a week, I think, is all we can expect for now. But if I was going to be very optimistic, I'd say we can infer that Kate is getting better because but he's it, not at her side. And it's interesting you're saying that this isn't necessarily a full-time return to duties mm. after the Easter holidays. We're going to things are going to look rather different for a while while yes. he's supporting Kate and the children. Yes, I think from what I gather, Kate actually does want him to be back on royal duty because she believes in you know she believes in the royal family. Of course, she's mm -hmm. you know the star, but you know he feels very obligated to of course be with her. So what I've heard is that they're going to couple his events. So if he does a, one day of working, he'll do two events in a day, and then maybe a break for maybe up to another week, and then a couple of events. But he's not going to be doing you know two or three things all across the cu country, cutting ribbons for a, a week mm. at a time anymore. I mean, he looks so comfortable. Actually, I think he does this kind of stuff really well indeed. Yeah. Should we talk about his brother though? Because his brother 
Well, just explain what his brother's done in terms of a date that he's put in terms of uh, the US. Yes, well, he said that the date he, he officially stopped being a UK resident was uh, in 2023 when his father kicked him out of Frogmore Cottage, when he was evicted from Frogmore Cottage. And he could have put any date. He could have put 2020, which is when he left the UK, but instead he put that specific date. I think personally he's trolling his father, <laughs> to be honest, because it's just, it seems to me so spiteful that he put that date. Obviously, he is a bit bitter that he got turfed out. But the reason that the King took that decision was because Spare had just come out, and in Spare, Harry savaged Camilla, who mm. we all know is, you know, his father's favourite, you know, person in the world. So. It, 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 was, it was a bit of tit for tat, I think. There was also the feeling that the King didn't want to have all these empty mansions sitting around, yeah. wasn't mm. there? And that perhaps Prince Andrew, there in Royal Lodge, might have to downsize to Frogmore yeah. Cottage. Uh, there was cottage, talk at the time he would go anyway. It's not cottage, really a cottage, yes. Uh, and that the yeah. Waleses could move into Royal Lodge. Well, that yeah. hasn't happened. They're settled at Adelaide Cottage, and as, as we've discussed, a lot else going on for them at the moment. Yeah, the Monopoly board was shifting at the time, wasn't it? And um, and don't forget, Harry spent 2.4 million quid doing this place up and then never really lived in it. So it might have just been Charles being frugal, you're right. Um, and uh, as you say, there was a lot of talk at the time that Andrew would move out of Royal Lodge and he never quite did. He sort of pretty much stood firm and refused Squatters to leave. Rights. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And let's just move to Meghan about American Riv Riviera Orchard. So this hard is... to say, isn't it? Yeah, well, it is actually. And you'd think if you were choosing a domain name, you'd choose something rather shorter than that. But the UK yeah. one, it's not being, there's no cyber squatting on it. Well, I suppose, you, you know, just in terms of the URL, it goes somewhere else. Yeah, so. It looks like a very mischievous prankster has set up the website so that in Fred, it instead goes to the Trussell Trust, which is a food bank donations charity. And, uh, and it's signed off, hope you don't mind, Meghan, Catherine. And of course, it's not Catherine, the Princess of Wales, but, you know, it had us all going for a second, probably. But it's some mischievous prankster just making the point that, you know, Meghan could be doing so much more with her new food brand and her jam and could be back at home being dutiful and doing royal service and, and helping out the poor and needy. But instead, she's marketing her lifestyle. And a mischievous prankster, potentially, but actually uh, something done with a heart for a pretty good cause here and yeah. in line with what we saw William doing yesterday all yeah. around food banks. And the Trussell Trust more or less endorsed it, if I was going to push it that far. You know, they said, it's a great cause and we're sort of grateful. By the way, it wasn't us, though. You know, it they were quite clear about that. It was quite a clever bit of marketing yeah, by someone, Great, actually. Great but marketing for the us. Trussell Trust, yeah. And, and so what happens, and we believe the King might invite Meghan and Harry to Balmoral this summer. What is yeah. going to happen? What will be the response to that? I think... Even if Harry comes, I just can't imagine a world in which Meghan comes over with the kids. It's really sad. I mean, I, I honestly don't think it's going to happen, if I'm going to be honest. I don't know what you think so, but I just there's no way in how Meghan's going to come over and stay at Balmoral, I don't think. No, and also, do you think it would actually be an invitation? Or will it be, as we've been told before, well, the door is always open? Yes, I mean, it's, it's well known that the Queen and now the King have the family over to Balmoral for the summer. So that's an open invitation and it's a really important part of the royal family's time together when they're not working. Mm. So, of course, Charles is never going to say you're, you're banned from Balmoral. I heard on the great... But the Waleses aren't going to be happy if... No, I mean, there's to. no chance that the two families would cross over, that's for sure. Um, but I heard on the grapevine that Meghan was never really very enamoured with the rural royal life and the sort of cold two-bar radiators and the boot rooms. And the California is where it's I mean, at. Can you imagine <laughs> Meghan stalking in the, in the Highlands all summer? I can't really, to Absolutely be honest. Absolutely, I can't either. Thank you no. very much indeed, Charlotte Griffiths from The Mail on Sunday. That's all from us here on Talk Today. Jeremy and Nicola are back on Monday at 6 o'clock. Kevin and Alex are up next. First, here's the weather with Joe. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather.
Hello there. Well, we're likely to see some drier, brighter conditions over the weekend at long last. Uh, but it's a bit of a showery end to the week. We've got uh, rain spreading its way southwards. It's going to leave quite a few showers through central areas and down towards the southeast. But those skies clearing from the north, not terribly warm temperatures. 13 or 14 at best in the sunnier west. But eastern coast, pretty chilly values in single figures. And to go with that, a brisk northerly wind. And then as we go through this evening and overnight, those clear skies are going to allow our temperatures to tumble. So the risk of a grass frost for many and one or two pockets of air frost as well. Only those eastern areas where we will see more in the way of cloud and we've got more of a breeze going on are likely to remain frost free. But thereafter, we're looking at a sunny morning, a bright start to Saturday, and we'll see some uh, fine weather throughout the day. We maintain this rather brisk northerly wind that's going to push some cloud over those north sea coasts, and some of that will make its way inland, spreading its way westwards. So we're looking at sunny spells and also times of cloud. Western areas seeing the best of the weather, but temperatures still on the low side, just making double figures for most. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eave it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All right, Oi, oi, treat, oh. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale, and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know uh, it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, you put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost.